What's up, everybody? Super Tuesday in the studio. Uh, super excited to be here. I don't know where that came from. Just felt appropriate, right? <laughs> super Tuesday. Super that's, what that, that's what that is. <laughs> super Tuesday. That's right. Uh, free stream tonight. No, no uh, Bonsai Society of Portland this evening. Uh, meeting they take July and August off, and then we'll be kicking it with you guys again in September, October, and I believe November. Um, and so instead of trying to do uh, some sort of iconic piece of work or whatnot, we wanted to jump into some of the feedback we've been getting from you guys about, hey, awesome that you can be styling, you know, $10,000 pieces of raw material or these trees that, you know, Mr. Kimura can handle and you guys can handle. How about taking it down to something that's a little bit more familiar, identifiable, and talking about some of those basic entry points where we can access um, the stream and get some of the same material and exercise some of these same techniques. And I think you guys are spot on. Um, and so we took it back to some of the kind of the old days, right? The good old days. And uh, started going nursery hopping again. And this evening is uh, the first of a series that we're gonna be due. Uh, doing of nursery stock exploration, where we actually go to the nurseries around our local area, we dig through all of the material that they have on hand, and we find that piece that speaks to us, we talk about the reasons that it speaks to us, we bring it into the studio, and then we share with you guys what can we do with this to make this the most amazing bonsai it could possibly be. Um, and so, before we get started, just want to say thank you to our Tier 1 members. We love you guys. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, tier 2 members, Mastery, hope those archives are still continuing to feed your uh, bonsai knowledge and evolution of skills. Tier 3 members, the live Q&As, the additional tertiary content, our ability to exchange, we very much appreciate that and, uh, and couldn't thank you guys enough for the support and being part of this massive movement. Uh, I got Miss Kendall on the microphone tonight. Hello. Uh, Arthur on the switcher as always. Ricardo no, no. is not in studio this evening. He's in Chicago for, uh, for a wedding or something like that. Much, much missed, uh, Ricardo, but we've got Junior on the detail camera this evening and uh, couldn't be happier to have Junior in here. As always, Mike, or uh, <laughs> Mike, Lime is on the EQ, giving you guys that uh, good buttery sound. And so I would say, uh, Kendall, do you have anything for the crowd? I don't think so. No? Keep, uh, keep questions on target, which is a wide target tonight. Nursery stock as the subject. Feel free to go far and wide with your questions about selection of nursery stock, how you find and milk that uh, potential out of that material. Uh, live Q&A, 10 o'clock Thursday. 10 o'clock a.m. Thursday, live Q&A. Uh, we're gonna be diving into uh, tier three members and all of your questions. If you guys have any one-on-one -on -one necessities for trees, styling, horticulture, et cetera, uh, schedule that, colton at bonesimerai.com or info at bonesimerai.com. Um, to start this stream off, are we ready to blast off? Yeah? Are you holstered? Okay. Yeah, sorry. I, like, I like this nursery series. This is good. I feel literally like I'm in college again. Couldn't be happier. Uh, to start this off, we're gonna take you guys with us to the nursery where this particular blue rug juniper um, was selected. Before we blast into that video though, I'm gonna talk about what I wanna do with this tree. We'll blast you into that video and I'm gonna do some of the menial work that you guys don't necessarily need to be a part of so that we're set up to get through this stream this evening on, on what is a very complex piece of material. So, uh, this is a blue rug juniper, which is uh, a very common species in the landscape very iconic for its blue tinted foliage, but also for the fineness, the real small, fine, delicate twigs. And there's a nursery down the road from us that has had a lot of these really old, super uh, bent, gnarly blue rug junipers for a long time. And I was hoping that we would go there and we would find this beautiful gem of a cascade or something really cool. Um, they had a ton of new stuff. They had blown out all of the old stuff. And this little decrepit uh, tree was tucked in the back of the nursery. It was like the quintessential nursery find. Um, but when we looked at it, I was looking at it and I was like, oh my gosh, this straight trunk. No, that's garbage. All the branches start from the top. That also is kind of unfortunate. What in the world are we going to do with this thing? And then I started thinking, right? And I started thinking like, gosh, has anybody created a connected root, um, clump style juniper from nursery stock before. What do I have that's of merit in this tree? I've got this big swelling at the top. 
Um, I've got all of these branches kind of, uh, you know, hanging and weeping off of this tree. It's a specialty conifer in the world of the landscape industry. Can I do something interesting with this based on just expansion of the tool set and uh, a little bit of creativity and create an incredible bonsai? I do believe I can. So we went ahead and we picked it up. We said, this is the one we're going to work on. Let's create a killer tree this evening for you guys, show you some of the creativity that we can apply to a tree that has a very humble beginning, and then how we nurture this to give you that kind of variety in your collection, and allow you guys to have a lot of fun finding that material, using that material, and developing that material, okay? So we're going to take you guys to the nursery with us. When you come back, we're going to have some of the preliminary work done on this. We're going to talk you through how we made the selection, why we made the selection, what you guys should be looking at when you're making your selections to find that gem amongst that sea of trees that are never going to be really worthy bonsai material. Take a look at this. We'll see you when you come back. We're going nursery hunting today. I, I believe there are some blue rug junipers at Means that have been there for several years. And uh, that's kind of what I'm going to search out today because the blue rug juniper if you can find an old one that's kind of sat and become pot bound, a very, very fight, fine type foliage. So we'll see what we can find. There's also the potential for some, you know, small barberry or uh, deciduous piece of material that might have a, a twisted trunk and be perfect for a little shoheen. And then uh, you always have the potential for a big overgrown, larger piece to, to be air layered and develop a super nice small tree out of a big beefy trunk that has no real value as a landscape piece of material. You can get them for cheap and air layer them and do something special with them. So all of those things are on the radar for today. And we go into the rabbit hole. So basically when I, when I come to a place like this and I start looking for material, I'm looking for small, compact, I'm looking for thick, I'm looking for tiny needles, I'm looking for interesting shape. Anything that stands out as a unique feature is what I'm after. So seeing these cedars here, seeing kind of this spreading, spreading sort of mounding, weeping. Chances are most of them are gonna have a stake train shape, but you never know. And you used to always be able to tell very quickly whenever you'd go nursery sort of scavenging with people who was there to actually find material because they're the people that are willing to get dirty and crawl on the ground and really engage with, engage with the trees. And you see people that kind of pull a little branch aside. That's not how you find good material. I didn't actually think about, I didn't actually think about cedar today, but Boy, I love cedar, and this is a true cedrus cedar, ungrafted, so there's no odd union, which you do get a lot of times when you start dealing with nursery stock. Got some good, good movement and changes of direction, which I always look for. The more changes in direction that you get on a tree, that, you know, we talk about movement. What is good movement? Good movement would be, you know, sort of non-repetitious changes in directions, different angles, different spaces, and different planes. And these have some real interesting, really interesting lower branching, which will have to work to get health back to the interior. But the fact that they're not grafted, they don't have any inverse taper, they come down, they all seem to have a really good, nice spread and root base. You wanna make sure that, particularly in nursery material, when you're looking for nursery material, that root base where if, if it's planted and the roots are down in the ground and there's soil mounted up on top of it, a lot of times that'll create inverse taper because that portion below the soil isn't getting all of the interaction of the light and the uh, expansion and drying and moisture movement that below the soil is being protected from. So you get a higher growth rate where the sun is hitting the trunk versus where it's not. These are, this is a, these are really, really good potential here. Okay, notice the thickness here right at the soil line and then notice how it gets much more narrow once we get down there before we ever get to any roots. This is very common. I mean, it was planted up to here, so you see the swelling right at the point where that soil line was, and then it actually gets more narrow below it. 
that's what we're checking for every time we're looking for a base. So we want to be making sure when we get down to that base that we hit that soil line and that trunk continues moving out to that root flare and that nabari that's going to show us that stability. Everything else about this, when we start to look at it and we look at the options for branching, we look at the changes in direction is good. That's a bummer. But this is, this is hunting for nursery material. Check this one out. These two trunks kind of intertwine and they twist around each other. Whoa. And they start together at the base. Oh, that's, this is cool. You see this? You see that though? It looks like there's a little bit of a inverse there. It's so hard, so hard to find good material. This is a possibility. It's got kind of a little bit of a flaw, not a bad one. You know, sometimes I always think maybe these weeping cedars could have potential. They've got that real predictable movement that goes through them. Well, there's a blue rug back there. Look at that. Huh. So this is a blue rug rooted in the ground, full, fully in, in uh, you know, rejected. But notice how all the branches come from the top. This is a grafted tree made for a landscape. All of those branches were either grafted at the top or it was stake trained and it was limbed up and then all the branches, as blue rug do, a creep, creeping juniper, they were all allowed to droop down. Structurally, that's not a very good specimen with just that singular thick trunk and all the branches coming from the top, not super awesome. But there are some creative things we could do with this and we are hunting for the blue rug. Maybe we'll come back to this. We'll see, we'll see what happens. I see potential here, I see potential here. Always in those ones in the back, right? Just kind of reject back here. It's funny, came across the blue rug. Weeping hemlocks, all very young, very fresh new stock. These don't really do much for us. Look at this species of azalea. Look how small that leaf is. This is kind of rad. Very, very, uh, very bush-like, broom-like. Yeah. Man, beautiful purple little flower though. And look at that scale. Just a really small, really dwarf variety. Interesting, never seen it before. Purple flower, kind of interesting. Let's go back to the blue rug. Ah, uh, <laughs> what's going on? All right, so uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that little visit to Means. Means is a place very, very near and dear to my heart. I literally, Bonsai Mariah has been landscaped by Means Nursery. They still don't know who I am, even though I go there with a gigantic, rickety old Ford Red flatbed pickup, 1981. I've broken down in their parking lot multiple times. I've bought like everything. It has a literal there. hole in the floor where the literally gas Literally, I can see the highway as I'm driving <laughs> in it. They're still like, huh, you're here. Buying a lot of landscape plants. Gosh, do you live locally? It's great though, you know, uh, that's part of the charm of means they don't give a crap who we are. Um, but this, this blue rug, like I went there specifically for the blue rug juniper, knowing what they had, not having it, but you know, seeing the cedars and seeing those characteristics and then digging into them and finding that inverse taper on every single base of the cedars was really indicative of the kind of things that we see in nursery material. And 
for you guys looking for quality bone size stock, you know, going through that process of really getting dirty, getting in there, finding those things, seeing that potential, learning how to identify all of those different characteristics. And we're gonna outline it very clearly for you in a little bit of a skull session on the whiteboard after, uh, after I show you what we're gonna do with this. Um, that is fundamentally how you guys start to find really good material for very affordable prices and give yourself an entry point into doing bonsai on that level that's affordable and you can play and you can learn and you can have fun and it doesn't break the bank and it's not too scary and it's not too intimidating. That's the purpose of this series. So seeing this tree in the back, seeing this really straight trunk and recognizing, ah, geez, there's not a lot of merit to this piece of material, but then getting up into the upper area, and Junior's got us dialed in here, and you guys will be able to see that there's a significant swelling in this upper area when we start to get to this location where all of these branches are forming. And I started looking at that and I thought, gosh, if, if, if we're in the upper canopy of the tree and there's an inverse swelling, we technically look at that as a very, very big flaw. But one of the things that I've come to realize as a bonsai professional um, and looking at material that other people don't value is a lot of times those things that we, you know, quote unquote flaws in a tree, we can kind of twist and manipulate and really maximize the quality of this tree. And so I started thinking, boy, if I took and kind of rethought about the angle of the base of this tree and I create an air layer that reforms the roots of this tree up around this widest point, all of a sudden, I set myself up for having this extremely, extremely interesting clump style tree where I've got all of these old, interesting, uh, different diameters, different sizes coming out of different points on the tree. I've got this really old, interesting piece of material here that makes a lot of sense to be utilized and maximized as a piece of bonsai um, you know, even, even for the quality and level of Mirai. I'm gonna be super excited to add this tree to the collection at Mirai. And so once I saw that, and I saw this movement in these branches, I saw that unique characteristic, I saw that foliar mass that just had that beautiful, tight, fine green foliage, all of these options, I started looking at that swelling and I thought, <clears throat> I'm gonna take this back, I'm gonna show people how you can take a piece of material that is basically a reject that hasn't sold for years but that age has accumulated and how we can take a, a plant that has all of these branches coming from one location and look at one way that we can utilize this to create an interesting bonsai. So before you guys go back to the school session on the whiteboard where we kind of outline some of these fundamental um, things that you should be looking for when selecting material, I just wanted to show you where that level was. I'm gonna spin this forward so that you guys can see this from afar, okay? And then I just want to walk you through this, okay? So when we're looking at this, that line is now going to be the new base of our tree. I've already got wire on several of these trunks, and I'm going to continue to do so. But I'm just going to pick some of these pieces up and start to show you where that concept is that encouraged me to start to think about working with this material. So if we pick all of these pieces up and we start to see you start to recognize, oh my gosh, we're gonna have like this expansive clump style tree. Now, I think I can <clears throat> assume we're not gonna be able to raise this one. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna take this off. And this branch, in terms of this work, may be the single most important piece on the tree. And here's why. In order to be able to utilize all of these pieces and create roots right here on a juniper of this size and this level of maturity, we have to have a branch that's below the point where we're air layering to continue feeding these roots so that they stay healthy and they drive that water transport up to this foliage mass until this develops enough roots to survive on its own. So if I don't have one of these big branches below that line, the whole thing will fail. And it'll fail in a matter of three months. That's when we would see this thing just all of a sudden tank. So I'm not gonna perform the air layer tonight, but I am gonna style out this clump style bonsai on the top of it. We'll do the air layer much like we did in the air layering spring watering discussion. You guys can refer to that to the technique, and I'm sure we'll follow this tree's progress, okay? So um, I'm gonna continue on with the wiring. Arthur's gonna blast you into the studio where we kind of outline those criteria and characteristics that we're looking for when we start identifying nursery stock material that's gonna be a, a potential good bone size specimen. And when you guys come back, we'll walk you through the concept of design on a clump style tree. So one of the biggest requests we've had from Mirai Live members is to have 
a little bit more of an accessible basic series or see how we at Mariah would handle nursery material that has um, a lot more simplicity in the materials demands and also what we would be looking for to find that really quality bonsai potential in a little bit more of an accessible, humble resource like a, a piece of nursery stock. And so uh, this marks the, f the first part of a multi-part series where we're going to be exploring nurseries around our, our vicinity here in uh, Portland, Oregon, and trying to find those pieces of stock that have that immense potential as bonsai, um, and then how we would go about handling those in the workshop um, or in the studio for you guys to engage with, hu with us live. Um, so in this first series, we went to a very local nursery, and uh, we started focusing on some of those fundamental characteristics that I apply when I'm searching for material. So when we go and we start to scour that nursery stock, I have a few very major points that I'm always looking for to delineate something that has bonsai potential from the masses of material that really doesn't offer much. And the first number one most important thing that I'm looking for is uh, some aspect of uniqueness or interest. Okay, so as you guys watch some of the tertiary content for this, you'll realize that I see a few different species of trees that have some interesting movement, that have some smaller needles or some smaller leaves, or that seem to be overgrown or grossly abused. All of these things are giving me sort of that entry point of, ah, there's something here that's different from every other piece of material sitting around this area. That piece of interest or that uniqueness is what would encourage me to take the time to start to look. Now when we dive in, I always start at that fundamental basic pillar that we tend to think about in bonsai, and that is verify we have a stable and expanding base. Okay, That stable and expanding base is one of the entry points for a good solid bonsai. It's also one of the entry points that tells us this piece of material has the potential to not only be valuable now when we create it, but continue to get better and enhance the image of the tree as that piece matures and develops. Okay, If I have that real stable base, then I'm going to start looking at what is the movement in the trunk and is that movement valuable for bone size? So I move to that concept of uh, interesting, uh, interesting, or pleasing trunk line. Now when we start talking about an interesting or pleasing trunk line in bonsai, we're talking about several very specific things. Interesting and pleasing as far as natural are concerned, are very, very specific. Okay? Natural means we lack repetition. And to lack repetition, it means we have to have three very significant things. We have to have different angles throughout the movement of the tree. We need to have differing inner nodes or what we would call distances between those angles. Okay, and then we would want that tree to engage three-dimensionally with us, so we want to have differing planes of movement. Okay, so we're saying first, ah, oh, there's something interesting. I see an interesting uh, movement. I see a, an interesting branch hanging off the edge of the container. I see this overgrown shrub with maybe some, uh, some, some dieback or a dead piece hanging out or a shari on the trunk. Or I see a big, big plant in a very small container, which would suggest that it's extremely old. Or I see really small leaves or really small needles. Any of those things are an immediate entry point. Let's take a look, right? We dig in. We tease away all of that accumulated soil because usually nursery stock is planted lower. The base is going to be below the soil line. So we tease that away. We start to see, do we have that base? If we have that base, we continue to look. Do we have a beautiful line? Beautiful line as far as bone size concerned is a natural line. A natural line lacks repetition. Lacking repetition means we have different angles throughout the tree, different internodes or distances between those angles, and differing planes so that that movement engages with us in a three-dimensional manner. Okay? If I've got a good base 
And I've got interesting line in that trunk or trunks if we're going to a multi-trunk style. Then we can start to think of, all right, do I have, right, um, any special features that give this tree or give this piece of material something beyond just your base and line, right? So this could be gin or dead branching. This could be shari or dead pieces on the trunk. This could be bark, interesting, really aged uh, representation of the species. Or this could be some sort of defining branch hollow or other feature that's giving us that really unique piece to grab onto and pull into that design as a specializing characteristic of that material, okay? So when I'm, when I'm heading through and, and kind of wading through all of this material, this is my consistent thought and the way that I filter out a lot of stuff that isn't going to potentially be valuable and I key into those pieces that are giving me some sort of insight into what can be done. Now the last thing that I want to talk to you guys about, particularly for this stream that you're about ready to watch, is the amount that an expanded toolbox of technique can open the door for you guys to see potential and material that others would not, right? Because in this particular stream, I found a really wonderful, overgrown, old blue rug juniper tucked in the back of a nursery, right? But the immediate base and the trunk line of this tree aren't necessarily really desirable. However, there's a point in a portion of the tree where we do find the potential for this to be a phenomenal bonsai moving forward with this very small needle and this very desirable growth habit on this extremely old nursery grown tree. And that's where my, my width and breadth of toolbox allowed me to see potential in this tree where maybe a lot of people could not. So just starting out, this is a really good fundamental way to approach how you sort through nursery material and nursery stock and find those gems hidden in those far corners of the nurseries across the United States or across the world. As you guys continue to spend time with us at Mariah Live, you're going to expand your toolbox, design, grow, and understand, build your skills so that you can see potential in a larger and larger quantity of material that you have access to. I hope you guys enjoy this stream. We're super excited to start this series and uh, I can't wait to show you guys how you can maximize very simple material and make phenomenal bonsai to build your collection with. Enjoy and we'll, we'll see you in the studio. So here's what I'm doing, guys. I don't see a lot of merit in the straight trunk, okay? So uh, let me slow down because I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty in here. Uh, this is really fun actually, by the way, P.S. Okay, so <laughs> talk on the whiteboard. Always looking for that base, always looking for that point of stability, right? But when you're searching through that whole nursery, you can't go to every single tree and be looking for the biggest, thickest base. So you're looking for something that gives character. What is it that's interesting? Is it a needle? Is it a leaf? Is it a branch? Is it a piece of deadwood? Is, is it a movement that you see in a primary line? We see that piece of interest and we say, ah, maybe, maybe the cedar. The cedar's really interested me. I thought, gosh, these have some interesting changes of direction. Got some relatively good girth. I could do kind of a longer cedar, might be really beautiful. Dug into that, each one of them had inverse taper. We went to the hinoki, right? We had that one hinoki that had those two trunks kind of spinning together. Ooh, that was really tempting. Again, inverse taper. Very common for nursery material to be buried too deep. That base, having all that medium around the base, doesn't allow that base to swell the same as the trunk above that point, and all of a sudden we get that inverse taper. So then we see this, this uh, blue rug sitting off in the back, and we say, oh man, neglected on the hillside. Nobody wants it. They're basically hoping it dies so they can stop watering it, or somebody is stupid enough to buy it. Uh, guilty as charged, right? See that straight trunk? Definitely not what I wanted. Nice fine foliage definitely was what I wanted, right? And then I get in and I see that massive inverse swelling with these older branches and I said, ah, there's my characteristic. Big bulge in the trunk, lots of options coming from that bulge. Three months, good air layer. At this time of year, I got a whole new tree that's a multi-trunk style juniper. Go find that anywhere in the United States. Not gonna be possible, right? So this is a very unique piece of material, all right? So when we start talking about that base, we also need to talk about that line. So now I have a base, it's in a different place, I'm taking advantage of this material based on an expanded tool set, right? Understanding how to air layer when, 
where, how we maximize it, right? But the lines that I'm now creating are the same lines you guys would be looking for in terms of the movement if you have that base. And we're saying different angles in terms of every turn that happens on that tree, different distances between those angles, and different planes that that tree engages with. And what does that create? That creates natural movement. That creates a lack of repetition, a lack of pattern, a lack of predictability. All of those things are how we quantify natural in terms of a good line for bonsai, right? And then we're looking for that piece that we base that value off of. Do we have a shari? Do we have some interesting gin? Do we have some old bark? Do we have a hollow? Do we have a branch that's got that interesting movement? Do we have a bulge in the base of the tree that allows us to create a much smaller tree from an air layer and potentially have a very valuable piece of material for a very, very low cost, right? So for this one, we had that last characteristic, which is technically a flaw that we're choosing to use as a feature of the tree, okay? So I'm picking all of these branches up into the air. I'm gonna be moving them in a direction, and these, this direction is headed to the right. So for where you guys are looking, I'm carrying all of these to the right. Now in picking all of these up, it doesn't mean that I'm necessarily gonna use all of them. I just wanna see what my options are, how I can start to arrange the spacing, how I can handle each one of these pieces to create that clump style that, uh, that we don't often see cultivated, created, or utilized in Western bonsai, okay? So I'm gonna keep going with this. I've got a few more trunks to pick up. We'll do a little bit of branch selection to start to define the line base to tip of these trees, and then we'll start to wire knowing where we're trying to get by the end of the stream, okay? And I know we've got some questions from you guys, so as I'm working, we'll dig into those questions. Kendall, if we've got questions, go ahead and let them fly. Sure. Um, Michael's wondering, uh, with nursery stock, uh, say junipers, you often find a pot full of roots. Right. How do you go about managing this root-bound mess? Right, the root-bound nature of nursery stock. So I will honestly tell you guys that as far as nursery stock is concerned, that abundance of roots um, makes nursery stock extremely durable as bonsai. But as opposed to just diving into um, the work on the nursery stock from a specific area, we've got to be thinking about what are we trying to accomplish. And that's a consistent theme that we kind of go back to at Mirai. What are we trying to accomplish? What are we trying to accomplish? And for us, when we're talking about nursery stock and what we're trying to accomplish, we're trying to get that root mass reduced to a point where we can actually utilize that root mass in a bonsai container. And as a result, we're gonna start at that point of greatest limitation. And this is gonna be something that as we get into repotting um, this, uh, this winter and next spring, that's gonna be a consistent theme that I'm gonna be referring to you guys about that point of greatest limitation. Oftentimes that point of greatest limitation is not knowing what our base looks like and needing to expose the base of those surface roots to understand how far down it takes to get to that expansion of that root base, okay? But beyond that, the second place that we typically see as our point of greatest limitation is the bottom because most, most containerized nursery stock is grown in a very deep container. Now this is a function of uh, really good drainage because the taller this container is, the more gravity is acting on it, the more water is being removed. Balance of water and oxygen for maximum cultivation maintained very well in a nursery container of this size, okay? So knowing that, we may, once we find where those surface roots are, we may want to be reducing the height of this container and starting at the bottom so that we're able to get it into a shallow pot. Uh, Brian's wondering what the air layering window for guaranteed success is. <laughs> Brian's in LA. Brian's in LA. Brian. Mr. Kend, I'm assuming. Um, air layering window for guaranteed success doesn't exist. Uh, air layering window for highest chance of success, probably getting towards the end of it. I would say end of July. And I'm sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm really gonna sweat tonight. It is Very super hot. hot in the studio. <laughs> um, end of July, we're running up against it because, you know, and, and here's the thing about junipers is, 
Junipers need heat to be able to produce a lot of uh, photosynthetic resources. And so when we're looking at these junipers now heading into the warmest part of the year, this is when you're going to be doing work on a lot of your needle juniper species. This is also when you're going to be um, starting to do the maintenance and even, even starting to consider your major styling, this number two time of the year for major styling of your juniper species happens kind of at the tail end of summer, that early fall, and we're not that far away from that, that section of work and that scope of work and that period of time. So if we're trying to get air layers to take very quickly, we wanna do so when they're uh, photosynthesizing and metabolizing at a really high rate. That actually is happening right now. For junipers, For right, junipers, for junipers, right? If we were talking about deciduous trees, you could probably do some deciduous trees right now and still get roots to form before the fall. But I would say junipers right now still very much in the wheelhouse of uh, functionality. And I'll, I'll be moving back to a more well-lit location in just a second, you guys. But you're still in the wheelhouse, Brian. Uh, David's curious if the inverse taper in the soil, if that's repairable. Um, it depends. It depends on how bad it is. It depends on um, where it takes place, and it depends on the species. Because there are species that you can definitely um, get that base of that trunk to swell and grow at a faster rate than other points on the tree. Now, if it's a deciduous tree, you could always sacrifice a branch. Um, you could thread graft and grow it out. Um, you could uh, approach graft some roots to it to be able to encourage um, swelling at that location or eliminate that, that um, inverse, inverse taper. But if you're talking about a juniper, I would say it's very difficult outside of either one air layering or two, changing the planting angle. So if you've got an inverse taper and it swells and you change the planting angle so that inverse taper becomes the actual, actual width of the base, much like we've done here, where I'm taking this and instead of using it here where it's quite narrow, I'm now creating the base at this width so I actually get a wider trunk base. You could do the same thing with a narrow base in a tree that's a singular trunk and maximize the width of that using that inverse taper. That would be one way that I could see that functioning for you. Whew. Okay. Kind of a wild little thing going here, don't we? You la are you laughing? You're laughing at it, Kendall. Yeah, I just don't know what's, where, you're, where it's going. Ah, I'm sure everybody online is probably saying the same thing. <laughs> so you're basically going to get rid of that whole trunk. I'm getting rid of the whole trunk. And just start where that white line is that Starting you're Starting where the white line is. With the air layer. Uh, with an air layer. To create, essentially a clump style forest. And I'm moving all of those trunks up into that clump style forest. Now here's what I'm gonna do. This is where we're at, right? Now when I'm looking at this and I'm positioning all of these pieces, okay, I want to have a visible vantage point where I'm gonna be able to see each one of those trunks and I'm gonna adjust their movement so that I get that kind of visibility throughout the, throughout the composition. Now if my base is right at that white line, okay, my base is at that white line and I've got that branch dipping down, then I'll probably scar the bottom of that branch and hope to get some root production out of that as well. This side, the, the trunks on this side, we're gonna keep them shorter and they're gonna flow kind of into the center of this composition. Those trunks in the middle, those are gonna be the tallest and they're really gonna define kind of this clump as it moves out. So what I wanna do now is I wanna kind of go through, do branch selection, start to finalize some concepts for heights, for lengths, for branches, etc. And then we can come back and we can start to define style. And this is really where it starts to get pretty fun. Okay. So there was a, um, let's see, I had a Juniper 2 class here last week, uh, or last weekend, I should say. And um, there was a student in the class that said, man, you told us something in our very first class that really changed the way that I thought about bonsai design, which I was very flattered by. Uh, and he said, you know, when I was in my, let's see, I think it was in my first year as an apprentice, Mr. Kimura was letting me wire some pretty cool trees for a first year apprentice. Um, and I felt, I kind of felt like, you know, a little bit of hot 
kind of hot shit, you know? Like I was, I, was, I was good, I was doing my thing, I was, I was there, I was apprenticing, I was learning. Um, and he handed me this big, long, tall, nursery-grown cryptomeria. And it was straight, it was probably like a $10 tree at a local garden center. And I had never seen a client bring Mr. Kimura that kind of material before, and I laughed. And Mr. Kimura said, what are you laughing at? And I said, oh, I just can't, I can't believe somebody would bring this material to you. And he said, he made a, a statement that I'll never, ever forget in my life. And he said, who better to bring this material to than somebody that can give it the best possible future? And he said, uh, just because you laughed, you're going to now wire this. Of course, uh, I had no clue how to maximize the quality of a piece of material that didn't have phenomenal characteristics. And... Um, as a result, I totally bombed on that work. I mean, I bombed, like bombed completely. So um, Mr. Kimura, when he was fixing the work, he, he continued to remind me, you know, you were laughing when I gave this to you. You were laughing when, when this tree came in. Now, now you understand, right, that a professional, there's no piece of material that is below a professional. And I think that singular concept as I've traveled the United States and worked throughout the country has really dominated my thought process and I think it's one of the things that has separated me from other professionals in the country is I recognize there's a humility that professionals need to have and there's also an ability that professionals need to have to have creative solutions based on the expanded skill set that we should hold as if we call ourselves professionals, that there's creative solutions based on that skill set that we should be utilizing and applying to the community and teaching people how to take humble material and make it work for you as bonsai, right? And so going to the nursery and seeing this piece of material, I brought it back to the team at Mirai, and every single person has laughed at this. Every single person at Mirai <laughs> has laughed at this. It's true. Kendall's still laughing. It's Kendall's still laughing. Arthur, you didn't laugh? I didn't laugh. Troy, Troy, you were Troy, laughing. Troy, Troy didn't laugh didn't Troy, Troy laughed. Troy and laughed very. Troy hard. actually looked at me kind of and scoffed, kind of like, "Are you? Still, you brought that? Like, of all you're the trees, disrespecting the trees. Of here. all the trees I have to, of all the trees I have to water, now I gotta water that. I'm gonna tell you guys this. I'm just gonna make this <laughs> statement. I'm gonna make. I'm gonna share this with you guys right now. By the time this is done, you guys are gonna be like, <sighs> shouldn't have laughed, shouldn't have laughed, because it's gonna be a clump style juniper like you guys have never seen. When you say clump style. Yeah. Did you describe that? Yeah, you? that's a good. So whenever we have multiple trunks, one of the characteristics of a good clump, and I'm glad you took it there, Kendall, because um, this is important. I don't hear people talk about clumps. I don't hear people talk about root connected um, trees very often. But when we start talking about clump or root connected trees, we're talking about a tree that has multiple um, trunks originating from the same base or connected via roots of the same system. Okay, so if we talked about like the ultimate macro um, connected root uh, tree in North America, it would be the largest li living organism in the world, which is a grove of aspen trees outside of um, Salt Lake City, Utah called Pando, right? Because all of the trunks of this, you know, several square mile grove of aspen that all happen to turn colors at the same time because they're all genetically connected as well as physically connected, right, are all part of the same root system. So these trees now grafting here, getting roots to grow 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 here, are all gonna be on their own root systems, but they're all gonna be connected via that major mother stock base. And that's gonna be really interesting to see this thing evolve and develop because it's an aesthetic that in Japan, they are constantly cultivating. And in the Western world, we, I don't see anybody. Randy Knight's the first grower I've ever seen cultivate this as an intentional uh, endeavor to create a connected root style. And he did so with a beach that um, is now happily residing in Delaware. And it was for me, it was like, wow, Randy, I didn't even know you could do that. So this, this material, when I saw it, it was almost like, it was like instant. Ah, we've got something special here. Really something special. Did you say something about grafting stuff onto this? Nope. Oh. Nope. I said I a ra heard. raft style. Oh, okay. Ra connected root or a raft I style. I see, I see. Yeah. Okay. And Troy, you did too laugh. 
He laughed with his eyes. He, la he, he laughed with his body language. With his soul. With his body language. <laughs> <laughs> Troy did have to remove this from the trunk, and I'm sure it was kind of a uh, what-the-heck moment. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Uh, yeah, we do. We have some a follow-up question about the root bound uh, question. Okay. Um, so removing the bottom of the root mass makes sense, but what about the knotty mess in the rest of the pot? The knotty mess, yeah. So, so once we remove the bottom of that root mass, right, and we get that to a depth that we feel comfortable with, the next place that we're going to have to tackle is the sides, right? Because that's going to be really heavily compacted amount of roots, okay? So when we're attacking that side amount of root mass, what we're looking to do is we're looking to reduce that and form that to the, contain the conceptualized container that we're potentially looking to put this tree in. And that doesn't mean that we have the container picked out already, okay? We have an idea. This should be in a rectangular container. This should be in a round container. This should be in an ovular container. We know the front is going to be in a general vicinity where those characteristics that we talked about, the best base, the best line, and the best features are all visible, okay? So that gives you guys a little bit of a track to run on to be reducing that root mass and kind of constructing that root mass so that we're able to make intelligent decisions in that initial repot. But when you have so many roots in a, in a tree, like a nursery uh, container type of tree, that's a really good thing because it allows you to be able to go back into that system and heavily reduce that and still have those fine roots that are carrying that water up to the foyer mass of the tree. So it's a process. We start by identifying the base. We then move to the bottom or the point of greatest limitation. We reduce that. We work in from the sides. And if we still have a very dense root mass and we have room to remove, we would come back up under the center of that base and start working on that sheen. And if you guys have any questions about the sheen, what that means, how we would handle that, the sh um, shore pine repotting. Repotting Re fundamentals. Repotting fundamentals. We attacked. In we the archive. Yeah, we absolutely attack that exact concept in that um, archived video. But to just be really clear with you guys, the sheen is the, por the portion of soil immediately under the base of the trunk. And that is really where you set yourself up for the ultimate kind of health of the tree to be carried from moving forward. So if you can get that in that first repotting, if you can get that set up, great. If you can't, that's usually the focus of the second repotting after we get everything else established. That answered the question? Yeah, I think so. Cool. Um, Tom's wondering, this is a follow-up to the uh, inverse taper question. Uh -huh. what, what if you ground layered inverse taper? You could ground layer inverse taper. That's another opportunity, Tom, for sure. For sure you could ground layer inverse taper. And then Michael was wondering, what's the ETA relatively on how long the air layering might take to develop, uh, to develop and be ready to cut? Yeah, so, so think about when you guys start asking these questions, you've got to think about the mechanisms that are at, at play here, right? So if you're air layering a tree, what you're doing is you're starting to you're starting to pull on the resources created via photosynthesis to accumulate sugars and starches that are, that are essentially flowing down the trunk and accumulating at the point where the air layer is formed, right? So if that's the case, the more foliage mass you have on this, then the more opportunity you have for the root mass to produce new fine roots based on the accumulation of those uh, sugars and starches. So for me, I'm going through the styling process first on this and heavily reducing the foliage mass. I actually would have a greater amount of success if I air layered this without taking all of the roots off, okay? But I also know that this tree is gonna rebound extremely well and probably photosynthesize much, much better based on opening it up and getting rid of all of that light impediment, not allowing that light to those interior branches, I'm gonna get a higher quality of growth, I'm gonna know the style of my tree, and maybe I prolong, maybe I prolong the air layering uh, effort by an extra six months, but this isn't a race. I'm not trying to get this done as fast as I possibly can. Say for example, you guys had three of these in a nursery, you took each one and you wired it just a little bit different. Okay, so each one's got a little bit of variety, a little different flavor, et cetera. 
this is when we start creating bonsai as kind of a variety. You apply different concepts, different um, clump style or connected root styles, wind influence versus a more upright form, etc. And these were the kinds of challenges that I watched Mr. Kimura time and again confront and, cr and come up with creative new solutions on how he was going to actually maximize these individual, very unique and very difficult pieces of material for clients that were willing to pay the money, not for the finished product so much as to see the innovation and genius of Mr. Kimura at work. That was really what they were paying for. you know. But humble material requires creative solutions. I know one of the big hopes in this whole thing was that I could show you guys how to take a nursery piece of material and make an interesting bonsai from it. In my feeling, in my professional opinion, this is maybe one of the more creative solutions I've seen somebody come up with for a piece of nursery grown material. Um, but I, I know it definitely doesn't meet the expectation that everybody had and I really, I, I love that. I, lo <laughs> I love showing you guys the way that you could use something uh, with a thought that nobody else would have come up with. And it felt like we were on an episode of American Pickers. <laughs> P.S. Were the people at the nursery surprised? Yeah, so we have, we have to call ahead, right, to like get filming opportunities. And, uh, or, or, or filming permission, excuse me, not opportunities, filming permission. <laughs> and they didn't call us back in time. <laughs> So they actually called us back after we had gone and filmed, and they're like, you know, we don't think that's a good idea. And we were like, oh, cool, we already did it. And they're like, oh, if you already did it, that's fine. <laughs> I love that rural Oregon attitude. R rural, rural, rural Oregon, that's right. Uh, Michael has a question. Michael says, I know you say to never fully bear root a tree, but is it okay to do it with healthy nursery stock? Um, so if I say never fully bear root a tree, I mean never fully bear root a tree. There's never a time where I think it's okay to fully bear root a tree, uh, whether it's healthy nursery stock or not. Um, and in fact, you know, healthy nursery stock, I think a lot of the, I think a lot of the um, mentality, and you guys are probably, as, as a beginner, I think you have to test this, and I think you have to try this. And so, Michael, I won't hold it against you if you say, Ryan Neal said to never fully bear root. I'm gonna go ahead and go fully bare root it because it's a piece of nursery material that I don't care about. The worst experience in the world that you're gonna have in bonsai is when you go and fully bare root something and you repot it and it becomes something very good and you're like, oh, oh my gosh, I hope this didn't die. I didn't think it was gonna be that good. I shouldn't have fully bare rooted. I should have done what he said and then it dies and then you say, yeah, he was right. He was right. He was right. Um, but I wouldn't encourage you to fully bare root it and I guarantee you if you put the time in, on a piece of material that has the criteria that we talked about in place, right? You use those selection methods, best base, best line, best features, or some sort of interesting feature, and then you maximize that by selecting a front and coming up with a creative solution for that, which is really what we're trying to do here, that you're gonna want to show some sort of reservation and respect for that when you go to repot that tree for the first time because it will, it will become an interesting piece of material if worked correctly. Any tree can become a great bonsai. It's all in the manner that you look at it and how you, how you handle it. I would show that material respect or you'll regret it. So in terms of making this into great bonsai, Brian has a question about um, the timeline of getting this tree into refinement stage. Uh -huh. um, Brian says, so for example, this season, you're gonna probably do first branch selection Second season air layer if it's healthy. Third season, what do you what, what uh, no, are you going to do sequentially? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to air layer this immediately after this stream is over. Okay. Okay. And then I, and, and then his follow up question is how long until it's the I told you so this tree is awesome. So I'm guessing 18 months. 18 months was I think what I said on the stream uh, on one of those tertiary clips. If not, I said it today in tertiary clips that'll be available for tier three members where I kind of go through the process of cleanup. I talk about you know, branch removal on nursery stock to um, start to open the concept of design, et cetera. Um, if you guys go through that, you'll see that. And I, I, I said 18 months, in 18 months, I think everybody will be like, gosh, we thought that was a joke and now we realize that we're wrong. Um, and the reason that I say 18 months is because we're gonna air layer probably tomorrow and get this tree started 
and we'll, we'll probably finish styling or become very, get close to finish styling tonight. And so once we finish styling and then we air layer it, this tree is on its way. We've begun the process. It'll take it a little bit longer to generate the roots, so we may be potting it up um, sometime in the late spring of next year as opposed to um, in the early spring. And that will set back its development just a little bit, but if we can get that done, then we're still on that 18 month kind of calendar of development, and that's really what I'm looking for. Could you talk us through what you're thinking as you're going through and kind of setting these yeah. branches? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, let, me, let, me, let me do that, that's a really good idea. So basically I'm trying to find I'm trying to find as much interior growth as I possibly can. Obviously, this is a nursery-grown piece of material. This is something you guys are all going to face. Um, and I can turn this a little bit so that you guys can watch me a little bit more and Arthur can still get the detail. Um, this is a nursery-grown piece of material. So what you guys are going to be experiencing with nursery materials, you're going to be experiencing probably a lack of growth on the interior branches, particularly if the piece of material is overgrown. This is extremely, extremely common. Now, one of the common things that we would do to counteract that is to create this really radical, uh, convoluted, snake-like movement in all of the branches so that it makes the branches look much shorter, right? We create this crazy thing and we pull all the branches in and then we show somebody the final picture from one angle and everybody's like, oh my God, you're a bonsai genius. Uh, and then over the course of the next five years, that tree has a compromised structure, right? So one of my priorities in this whole process is trying to create a good, solid, fundamental sound structure that I'm able to, um, that I'm able to build on as I get interior growth to form. And my whole objective in this first styling of any nursery material is maximizing the efficiency of photosynthesis by the way that I distribute the branches. So that means not trying to snake them a whole bunch, not trying to do much because, and I'm just gonna point this out here, you guys see these interior buds that exist where my hand is at? Those are the branches that are actually gonna form the tree when we start to reduce and prune. Now notice how I'm putting movement into it that is very similar to the movement I've put into the trunks. That's important. This is how we create that kind of synonymous structure that sets the tone for this entire composition. I wanna be making sure that I define that in a way that's beautiful, excuse me, and representative of the kind of design that I'm headed towards. And for this, it's not necessarily windswept, it just is a tree that has some interesting upward movement as a relatively standard clump, um, maybe growing in a pristine field or you know, a, a good pocket of soil in the mountains, but not showing the kind of tortured nature that some of the collected material does, right? And so I'm just creating that, that nice, interesting line that the tree already had via those older branches that encouraged me to select it in the first place. Okay, so this first styling is about maximizing photosynthetic efficiency. And here's the funny thing. Everybody wants to snake those branches and create an immediate bonsai. I will create a faster bonsai laying it out fundamentally like this and keeping it clean and focusing on this first portion of the branch than anybody that tries to compact that and has to deal with the repercussions of that over the course of that tree's evolution, I promise you. So anyways, that's my, that's my current focus as I'm wiring and laying these out. Each branch gets its own little ray of sunshine, right? I am paying a lot of attention to the movement that I'm putting in and how I lay these branches out to get that fan-shaped pad. I've got a beautiful foliage type in the blue rug, right? It's very small, it's very fine. You guys have, have to like to wire to be taking nursery stock and turning it into bonsai. One of the things that you see a lot of people do, and this is a misnomer that I wanted to kind of correct tonight for you guys. One of the things you see a lot of people do is buy a piece of nursery stock that they feel like they get a good deal on, and then they say, I'm gonna let it back bud before I work on it. That's not the way that it works, my friends, I'm sorry. If you wanna treat a back bud, you have to create a very photosynthetically efficient system so that it's laid out and you get all of those buds and branches getting all of that sunlight, laying that out in a very fundamental way, flat bottom so that you see delineation between those pads laid out in that fan shape so that you maximize its photosynthetic uptake. This is how you set the stage for back budding to be driven, okay? Keep the questions coming. Yeah. Um... 
William's wondering, how do you overwinter juniper that you've air layered? Ah, yeah, William, interesting question. So I've never protected an air layered larch or an air layered juniper. Um, I've always left them out exposed to the elements thinking I'm probably kind of going to come back to dead roots. And for whatever reason, I've never had that root mass die. And that's in temperatures as cold as two degrees here. Now, that's not to say that it will always be successful for you. But it is to say that through that process, when you start to get all of those sugars and starches accumulating at that point where you're air layering, that actually has a huge winterizing effect on the, the, that portion of the tree. And what I've seen and noticed is that those air layered roots are far more durable to cold than your standard root system, at least until they start supporting a greater foliage mass. And so I, I haven't done anything. If you're concerned, you would wanna pull them in when temperatures, temperatures get below 28 degrees. 28 degrees typically tends to be that threshold where we're gonna to start to see portions of the plant tissue experience frost. And with frost and freezing of that um, water molecule, you can get crystallization and rupturing of the cell. I wonder if for folks who are joining us on the stream who maybe don't know what air layering is, could we explain that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So let me just um, kind of come back to where we're at and actually let me join you guys. Oh yeah, okay, cool. Whew. It's happening. It's happening right before your very eyes. This is awesome. Okay, so air layering. Basically where I've drawn that white chalk line, I'm gonna remove a ring of bark. Okay, and I'm gonna take off the phloem, which is what transports sugars and starches. I'm gonna take off the cambium, which is what gives rise to or creates via cellular division, the phloem, and I'm gonna leave the xylem, which the cambium is also creating on the inside of the tree, and the xylem is what transports water. So, if I take this ring off, and I leave the water conducting tissue in the core, and I take off the tissue that creates new uh, tissue or cellularly divides in the cambium, and I take off the tissue that moves sugars and starches, what ends up happening is I create basically a, a, a plug in the drain here, where all of the sugars and starches that are created from photosynthesis stop right here because I've removed that tissue and they accumulate and they form scar tissue. Meanwhile, water is moving up through the core, keeping these hydrated so they can continue photosynthesizing and I can continue to deliver fertilizer. And what ends up happening, that scar tissue, if I put moss around it or I put soil around it, all of a sudden that scar tissue produces new roots and I get a new root system from that location, okay? This is what we call air layering to create new material. So you can basically start the bottom of a tree halfway from, up the trunk from anywhere. That's right. From anywhere. Now, the kicker to this piece and the thing that you guys as bonsai practitioners should take home on a large conifer, and this is not true for deciduous trees because deciduous trees move so much more water through their system. On a large conifer, if you're air layering, you always have to have a branch below the air layer that's feeding these roots so they continue to pump water because I said I'm actually reducing the foliage mass so that it's going to take longer for new roots to form. Because that's the case, I need to make sure that these roots are still fed and kept alive to continue pumping that water and driving that system forward. So if I took it below this branch and I had nothing here, there's a, a strong chance that I wouldn't get enough roots to sustain this before these roots said goodbye. And that's, that's one caveat of air layering conifers, junipers uh, in particular. Uh, and then Greg was wondering if you're gonna use root hormone on the air layer. So I'm not gonna use root hormone. I've never had a problem getting a juniper. I've never had a problem. Arthur, are you getting that movement that I'm putting in there? Okay, cool, because this is, there's a few other design things that are happening here that I'm gonna focus your guys' attention on. I've never had a juniper struggle to produce roots, and the reason is, is they move a lot of sugars and starches through their vascular system um, because of their highly photosynthetic nature, and they also move a lot of water via that really fine root structure that they have. So it typically creates a system that doesn't need stimuli to be able to um, produce roots. But if you were dealing with a, dr a much, much drier tissued plant, um, like a pine, like a hinoki, like a, yeah, pine or hinoki feels good, then you may want to be utilizing a rooting hormone in order to be, um, inducing or encouraging that root formation to occur. What are the design things you're noticing? Yeah, so um, 
just coming back to how do you take, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you guys through this. This is actually a pretty major aspect of Junipers that I'm going to walk you guys through when I come to the next one. I did this one super fast, um, and I hope you guys watched it. But this tree has a ton of really long shoots that have foliage all out at the tips. Now I'm going to turn this for you when I'm done, and I'm going to show you what I created just out of one single branch. And this is, this is a fundamental aspect of junipers that you guys have to know in order to execute this kind of work and have it really thrive. Okay. Okay, so this, this trunk right here is what I'm looking at. Now, that was just one singular elongated piece. Okay, so it looked a lot like this. And I took it and I created this interesting movement in the beginning of it, okay? And then I have all of this foliage out at the tip here. Well, if you take that foliage, right, and you've got all of that foliage loaded up on one side, and you take it and you flare that like this, boom, boom, boom. Basically what I do is I set myself up to have that fan-shaped branch pattern. Let me show you that on detail. Okay, I have that sh fan-shaped branch pattern right there, and that sets me up to be able to create out of this one long leggy branch a really wonderful, relatively finished branch shape, okay? So when I'm trying to define or redefine the height of these trees on this particularly interesting, intriguing, yet challenging piece of material, understanding how to take these big, long, leggy branches and in a structurally sound way, so they continue to photosynthesize, so that we create a structure that improves, et cetera, put that movement into those, and maximize that foliage mass, and build a beautiful design, and set that uh, form for the future to improve upon. This is a very, 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 very major skill that nobody ever teaches or talks about. Brian asks, regarding quote unquote snaking the branches, mm. Uh, in your opinion, is this a nearly uh, completely misguided technique or does it play a role occasionally? Uh, what is snaking the branches? So snaking the branches, yeah, and this is good because one of the big questions when we start talking about snaking is they're going to say, well, isn't Ryan snaking the branches? And no, the, qu the answer to that, just, just to be clear so that we're all, we're all functioning on the, same, uh, on the exact same page. I'm not snaking the branches. I'm putting rather subtle movement into them compared to what a lot of people would be doing to try and give you guys the impression of a finished tree. But I am putting good movement into them that is, I would say, in, in the spirit of what the trunks are already naturally doing that are influencing my decisions, okay? But basically, snaking the branches is to say, you put a ton of really superficial, over-exaggerated, really pull that in and you just snake all these things in to try and shorten those branches and create a lot of density with these really long pieces. Is that appropriate? I'm gonna say, Brian, no, never, because you don't set the structure for the tree to improve. You unwire that, they unravel like an accordion. You haven't improved the photosynthetic efficiency to induce backbutting to be able to take that length out of them. You've basically set a system up to fail over the course of time and never improve. If I snaked all these branches, this tree would inevitably never get better. It would never be a valuable piece of material. And that's the difference between sitting here and teaching you guys via Mariah Live how to work on this versus what a lot of other people would be teaching you. So as opposed to just creating movement and letting the tree grow into that movement? I would say understanding. And I, you know, I'm putting movement in. I mean, Arthur's sitting here. He can give you guys a detailed shot. Um, I'm putting movement into this, but the movement is movement that will stay. The movement is movement that is uh, considerate of the trunk lines of the trees and synonymous with the style that we've started. And I think the movement too is not over exaggerated and capable of sustaining photosynthetic efficiency, photosynthetic uh, maximization of the production of resources. And when you unwire this, you're only going to be able to prune back, shorten, reduce, and improve the structure as opposed to reinventing the structure every time. And that's the real disadvantage of snaking branches or over-exaggerating that movement is you end up basically just rewiring the tree every single time. Arthur, is it, is it going? Is it going? 
We had a lot of copper on that tree. Got love. We're not even close to done. What time we got? Is an hour and ten. Money, money. I used to go to this place in. Uh, used to go to this place in San Jose when I used to use Turfus because I didn't know any better because nobody told me. Uh, which I'm. What telling is that? Turfus is a baked kind of clay product that they use on baseball diamonds. Um, to soak up the water and a lot of people use it as a bone size substrate. I'm not going to open that door tonight I don't feel like going there um, And trying to defend that whatever I'm gonna say about it surface surface sucks That's what I'm gonna say about it and, and you guys are gonna have to go ahead and accept that um, But there was a guy that worked at the place and he used to always call customers easy money so uh, we would, I would walk in there, I'd say, I, I need turfus. And he'd say, sure thing, easy money. I'll go get your turfus, easy money. And I just remember sitting there thinking about that as he was calling me easy money and thinking, God, is that, is that a derogatory like, thing to say to a customer who's shopping with you? Like, yeah, you bet, easy money. And I recognized that he was basically just sitting there and making fun of everybody that was shopping with him. But because he said it so nice, like it was OK, everybody was easy money. As that is, anyways, I, I, got, I got on that somehow. Are you going to start calling uh, Mariah live? No, no, <laughs> no, no. But, but there was a purpose to that, and I don't remember what it is. It'll come back to me, though, so cut me some slack, right? All right, all right. Thanks. Well, I have a question. What do you got? Um, when you're doing the initial styling, mm. you're, I'm, I'm guessing, you're trying to set the structure. 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 Right? Pri what does pri that mean? Primary branching. Primary, primary lines. branching. Primary so branching. Primary lines. And in this case, you know, where this differs a lot from Yamadori is with Yamadori, very rarely are you setting the, the primary line of the trunk, right? That's typically set, or you may just be defining the line base to tip of the apical region. Now, we'll come back to defining the line base to tip as a whole stream subject. That's a design component that I really want to emphasize for uh, Mariah Live members because I think you guys uh, need to understand design on that level in order to engage with this and maximize what we're showing you. That really plays into the mentality of how I handle trees. But um, for now, I think understanding that this is actually forcing us to define the branching as the primary lines is a really big part of understanding the scope of work and its significance. So this is primary, for sure. And we call, I call this uh, styling. You know, we, uh, any Mirai students out there, which, by the way, if, if, um, if you guys watching are interested in studying at Mirai, um, we're going to be launching our 2018 calendar in the, at the end of August, uh, beginning of September, for the class season for 2018. And if you guys are interested, send us an email so that we have you on the waiting list. And anybody on the waiting list gets um, first shot at open class spots. We're loyal to current students, but we have been able to make really good accommodations of a majority of the list. We haven't had an open class spot in four years now. So pretty exciting, but that's coming up. So if you guys want to come and study in person, uh, we're almost to that point where we're going to be launching the new schedule. Come see where it all goes down. Come see where it all goes down, be a part of it. Um, Greg wants to know if you could share your final outline and height of design. I'm almost there, Greg. I'm working so hard for you. Diligently working. I'm getting there. Oh, Brian has another question. Lay it on me, Brian. Um, about back budding. Okay. Brian says you've emphasized the importance of keeping foliage and maximizing movement of water nutrition uh -huh. through the branch. Is there anything you need to do in addition to this? To get back budding? Right. So uh, water, nutrition, sunlight exposure, those are the biggies, okay? If you, if you can give a good balance of water and oxygen, you lay this out so that you maximize photosynthetic efficiency. Now let's understand what maximizing photosynthetic efficiency means though. What that means is the way that we're laying this out gets the maximum amount of sun contacting the maximum amount of foliage mass. Okay? And in doing so, in getting that sun to contact that foliage mass, you're generating the most sugar and starch production that you possibly can in the tree. So if you're generating the most sugar and starch production, you're moving the most resources, you're, you're maximizing the amount of growth, 
this is what generates more vascular tissue. And in an air layer, that vascular tissue equals new roots. Okay? So when we start talking about that, you have to have that exposure to sun and you've got to have that contact in order for all of that to happen in that system to work very beautifully. Okay, but, but beyond that, there's no magic potion. Allowing a tree to grow, allowing a tree to photosynthesize, allowing a tree to thrive, all of those pieces are just par for the course for how we horticulturally produce the best possible product. So you, you brought all these branches up. Is, is the flexibility in the branches particular? Is that something you just know? Or is that species on, specific? On a blue rug juniper, this is one of their redeeming characteristics. Right? They have a tremendous amount of flexibility. And this is fairly what I would say juniper specific. But in all actuality, when you have, and this is, this is also a part of experience for you guys, if you get a field grown or a nursery stock piece of material that was produced and grown very rapidly, which there are, there are nurseries in the United States, there are nurseries throughout the world that are trying to produce big, girthy pieces of material very, very quickly, right? They're going to be feeding on an injector feed system. They're going to be trying to maximize the amount of resources that the tree has with every watering. So it's going to be a heavy chemical application of fertilizer on a consistent watering basis. If you're dealing with trees like that, that have grown very, very fast, then what you get is you get a very, very coarse, brittle branching. And it's very difficult to do what I just did in terms of trying to get all of these branches from hanging down to facing up, right? Because you have such a large growth ring per, per location that they don't have the flexibility. But this tree, this is an old blue rug juniper. I mean, I bet this tree is 35, 40 years old. And I say old, you know, when we talk about Yamadori and we're talking about three, 400 years. But it's all proportional to when you think about the amount of time that Yamadori was growing without a human being, having to water it, fertilize it, take care of it, et cetera, in the mountains. It was just there, right? Nature's bonsai. This has had somebody actually cultivating it for 35 or 40 years. That's a lot. That's a lot of investment. That's a lot of time. That's a lot of resources. Uh, when you can buy an old piece of material like this and you can, um, and you can get it for a price that is affordable, that's, a, that's a, a really special opportunity. And then being able to maximize it by having creative solutions and understanding the horticulture to to bring about these kinds of changes. Really, really cool to have that skill set built up in your repertoire. Did you hear that R? Rep repertoire? Repertoire. 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 Does it have a lisp? Do we do still I have still, the lisp? Do I still have the lisp? <laughs> I'm not sure. Sick. Sick. Love the lisp. Um. Um, Arthur, are you seeing what's happening here, and are you feeling it, or maybe I should turn this so you guys can see it. I'm just kind of, I want. I'm I, I'm staring at it, trying to figure out like what's going on. Okay. This is like one of those like, oh, you locked me in a cage, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and talk and talk and talk, and then all of a sudden, oh, I'm free. Hang on just a sec. I'll, I'll rotate this so you guys can see. There aren't that many questions. Brandon wants to know how much was it. We have some more. I, 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 have, I have some more I can ask. You pace, are you pacing yourself, or are they coming in slow? Um, they're, you know, just trying to keep it smooth topic. Gotcha. Going. Topic specific. I gotcha. What does Brandon want to know? How much was this tree? <laughs> Affordable, quote unquote. <laughs> this, th th this tree actually was a little bit beyond my price range. <laughs> like I took it up there and I was like, I bet this is going to be like 10 bucks. And then the lady's like, uh, that'll be $79. And I was like, $75. And she's like, no, sir, $79. And I was like, God, I'm in a hurry. I can't get to another nursery today. I'm just going to have to bite the bullet. So th this actually was more, more expensive than I typically would have paid. <laughs> Dang it means you let me down. Um, Bishop says, so I saw that chalk line for the air layer goes over the top of the bottom branch. Are you going to cut into that branch? Absolutely going to cut into it as the bottom portion of the air layer, but not cut into the bottom portion so that it is still has connection of sugars and carbohydrates feeding the roots below it. And then for roots to gain appropriate proportions, we're thinking 18 months. Is that right? Or how uh, I'm thinking 18 months until you guys look at this and you go, dang, that's amazing. 
I'm 18 thinking, months I, until. I, I'm thinking the roots, this will probably be separated early or, or uh, late next spring. It won't be capable of being separated like in March, but it'll probably be capable of being separated in May, June. So we're, we're looking at probably um, a, little, a little less than a year from now. This will be separated in a bonsai pot. I'm guessing by the end of the fall, you'll be seeing a fairly robust amount of growth taking place, and we'll have ourselves a new connected root style juniper at Mirai that we're just absolutely in love with. I'm excited to see that. Uh, mm -hmm. So what's the fertilizing scheme going to be for the tree as it's being pumped up? So I'm just going to do, uh, I'm going to do a strong, consistent application of organic feed. Nothing, nothing magical. So I, I, you know, there's, I don't, I don't have any secrets to, you know, it's not like I'm going to be using cow blood or something like that to get this thing to do these wonderful feats of horticulture. Strong, uh, you know, I would say quantity wise and frequency wise, Every five to six weeks, we'll go with a heavy application of fertilizer since this is in a nursery container, has better drainage, is capable of moving nutrition in and out of the container um, a little bit better than a bonsai pot. We've got more roots to be able to distribute that nutrition amongst so that we're less worried about that fertilizer doing damage. Um, yeah, we're going to go hard at it and see if we can't get it to produce a lot in a short amount of time. Arthur, did I nullify the purpose of the detail camera by coming over here. Um, nice use of nullify. That's like a nice. Did you, did that? That was good. Is that? Not completely. Not completely? Okay, well let me just get these back. When he says not completely, he means yes. Yeah, he's like, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I'm gonna get these back guys dialed for you so that we, we you can see some clarity through the entire portion of this section of the composition. And then I'll move back to the front. So David commented, so air layering is one method for developing nursery stock. Sure. What are some other methods? Well, so the focus of this actual like series on nursery stock was not to like show you guys how to air layer. I've already done a live stream on air layering. Um, the purpose of this was to go and find a tree based on the concepts of how we select material that's going to be good for bonsai, which is that base line and special features how we use that unique characteristic to draw our attention to material amidst the sea of you know, nursery material that's never going to make a good bonsai, and then digging in to utilize those to make that final selection. That was actually the purpose of this whole thing. Now, what ended up happening, and this is the whole thing with this stream for Mirai Live, you guys tune in and I have an idea of what I want to talk about, but you guys also have to understand that as far as bonsai is concerned for me, um, the idea of Mirai Live was to let you guys take part in my process, which my process starts the minute that this tree sits on this table. So I didn't know what this was going to look like. I had an idea, and then I set it down, and I started putting wire on it, and you guys are immediately involved in what's happening with this tree. So the discussion of that air layer was happening earlier today as I'm cleaning it, and I'm thinking still that I'm going to use this as a single trunk tree, turn half of it into dead wood, drape some branches across it to cut the line, and then I'm like, no, that swelling, these lines, best possible use of the material, that's what I'm going to do. So as far as utilizing nursery material to make good bonsai, air layering was not the key or was not the point, but that is what allows me, is going to allow me to maximize this material, and each week, that we do this series, I want you guys to, I wanna share with you guys that process of identifying those points of value and interest and then open kind of the door to how we can utilize those because nursery material is a very difficult thing. Although it's wildly abundant, it's a difficult thing to turn into a valuable bonsai tree. Right, and just as a reminder to everyone on the stream, we have um, a li an archive live stream where we all about air layering. Uh, it's called spring water. So you can check that out. Yeah, in the archive. check it out. Um, yeah, definitely check it out. I mean, we dial it down to the very details of air layering. Um, so when, when, when someone comes and brings a piece of nursery stock material to their turntable, would you suggest they sort of sit there and study the movement or try to find that special thing? Or do you think that should happen when they're selecting it? Um, so I think that that special thing is what draws your attention to the tree. And then I think you dig into that tree and I think you look for, does it actually have a good base? Does it have 
any kind of interesting movement. And we defined that interesting movement for you guys, right? So, so we're trying, I'm trying to give you guys as solid and fundamental of pieces of information as possible. The best thing for me to do to show you guys good nursery stock would be to take you out into the stockyard of Bonsai Marai. But that's different than what you guys are gonna experience because I've already curated that material. I wanted to take you guys with me when I go to a nursery and I say, ah, look at that, a blue rug juniper that's got some potential, how do we use it? Um, but I think you look for that base, you look for that movement, you look for those special features, and if, they, if it has something of all of those, you know you can make a great tree. When you bring it home and you set that tree on the turntable, you're still using where is that widest base, where is that greatest changes of angles, spaces, and planes to find that movement, where is that special feature, and that's where you're gonna be styling this tree from the front, right? That's your selection of the process, the process of selection of the front, okay? And then when you is that the first thing you do is select the front? You gotta select the front, yeah. Now, now one, thing, one thing that happens with this is when you've got a piece of nursery material and you've got all of that branching in the way, it's very hard to see those things. So the cording process of that material, because you know it has the characteristics to make a good tree, you just don't know what that tree looks like, the cording process or the dating process is cleaning out all those dead branches, getting in there and seeing those nuances and seeing those opportunities and being like, ah, even though I thought about this being a single trunk, this piece is just too good. These branches are just too good. I'm going to go with it, right? That's what happened today. And you guys will see those things, and that helps influence your design, right? So you got that front where you see that baseline and features. You know the tree very well after cleaning it. Now you can make decisions on, I'm going to use this branch to form, you know, the longest branch on the tree. That defines my movement. I'm going to use this branch to maybe potentially balance that. I'm gonna use this piece as the apical portion of the tree, and then I'm gonna distribute the foliage mass to guide people's eyes through this design. Could you kind of, with this design, show us what's the longest and what's the... I will, I will, I'm getting there. When you're there. done. I'm getting there, right? Because these biggest pieces, this branch right here and this branch right here are gonna be really pivotal, and I'm getting there. I'm flying through this work right now. So when we get there, I will show you guys that process. Let's, let's get there together. Let's make music together. Uh, Brandon's wondering how much foliage you can reduce without knowing its strength. Well, technically, I do know its strength because I'm looking at the blue rug, I'm looking at the quality, the quantity, and the addition of new growth, right? So if we know how to read a tree, we can, we can look at this tree and assume that we have enough strength to be doing this work, otherwise I shouldn't. And usually, with nursery material, unless it's just been totally neglected, you do have the strength to, to go in and do work on that material, assuming it's seasonally appropriate. And this is the other thing about this. It is seasonally appropriate to be air layering and it is seasonally appropriate to be wiring a juniper. At least we're getting very close to seasonal appropriate for wiring a juniper. And so I felt very comfortable. The whole, this whole thing you know, of, of sourcing nursery stock really hinges on all of those pieces aligning and they did for this piece of work. Tom has a good question. Tom's wondering if you have a particular order you like to go in, in terms of you get a piece of nursery stock, do you get it into a pot so that it's healthy and then do branching and ramification, or do you have an order? That's a, that's a great question, Tom. Um, and I feel like that's a question that's becoming more, as we get more educated about bonsai, we start to recognize that there's an order of operations that we need to have a little bit of clarity around so we know where to begin the process. For me, it, it hinges on what is the condition of the roots? What is the potential issues that I'm gonna be encountering here? For example, if I were gonna use this as a single trunk tree, I may have left all of the foliage on it and done the root work first because this foliage on a juniper is gonna enhance the recovery of this root system. But because I'm gonna be air layering this, to define that style actually opens up my area for air layering by lifting those branches up. And so I did the styling first, and then I'm gonna be air layering second, and I'm not gonna be worried about, about this as much. So it just depends on what are the conditions and the limitations that you're working with. Um, and for a lot of nursery material, the option is repot first and style second because the repot needs a lot of the unnecessary growth that you'll cut off in the styling to help regenerate the root system. That's a very common aspect of nursery material work. Do you find that nursery material are more prone to pests or disease? I don't think that nursery material is more prone to pests or disease. 
uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but here's what I do think. The soil that they use in nursery container production is much, 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 much more organic than what we use in bonsai. And when you start to talk about the right soil type for the cultivation of bonsai with the fo foyer reduction that we're doing and the goals that we have of reducing the growth, you need that balance of water and oxygen to enhance the resistance of pest and disease attack, okay? So what oftentimes happens is we'll start the process of reducing the foliage and making it a bonsai, and then we create a system where we're not moving as much water through the tree because we've reduced the portion of the tree that's transpiring, the foliage mass, and we've got this heavily organic soil that's holding all of that water, and consequently we see a higher susceptibility to disease and pests based on that lack of health created by that soil environment that was initiated by the reduction of foliage because we wanted to make it a bonsai. So Douglas has an example of maybe what you're describing. Douglas says, I had a nice blue rug juniper that I got at a nursery. Later discover, discovered it had apple cedar rust uh -huh. that would appear every spring. I couldn't get the, clear, the tree to clear the infection. Uh -huh. uh, what could I have done? Um, so number one, to, to get rid of apple cedar apple rust, you would eliminate species in the region that are part of the life cycle of cedar apple rust because cedar apple rust has to engage with apples, crab apples, pears, or the biggie in our areas, hawthorn, right, is, uh, is a big one, or ribes. Um, and so when you start um, dealing with cedar apple rust, if you can't clear the area of the, of the host of the disease, which, you know, on junipers, that's really what's happening, the juniper is just the portion of the life cycle that reproduces the spores. There's a whole other uh, portion of the life cycle that's happening in other species. And uh, if you can't get rid of those, then you are really in a big, uh, kind of a big heap of trouble because you can't stop the cycle from continuing to perpetuate itself. Um, the other thing that you can do with cedar apple rust is physical, physical removal and identification. And that's what a lot of people have to do to control it in their area is just simply identify it before it reproduces the spores. I knew, I knew it, I knew it, Arthur. I knew I couldn't keep it simple. <laughs> it's tried my, your darndest. I tried my. I was like, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna find a. I'm gonna find a really. I'm gonna find a normal, like soft, informal, upright trunk line. I'm gonna show people. I'm gonna show people how you make a bonsai. You know, like it, I can't. I can't do it, guys. I can't. I can't. I just. It's literally against my religion to like try and create some really, really generic, like, textbook rendition of, of a tree. Like, I saw this, and I was like, ah, I could do the single trunk and have this kind of, like, a little bit, you know, less interesting, or I could, like, air layer it, and I could make this clump, and I could create something that's never been created before, and I was like, yeah! And then we were down the rabbit hole. It was gone. I was gone. Like, I was literally Alice at that point. Chris has a question um, about the root bound topic we were talking about earlier. Uh huh. So after, do do you have to repot nursery stock material more often? Um. So I think that it is more a discussion of age in nursery material, and it's it's kind of it's nursery material is encouraged to be vigorous, and it's still very young in the relative. Um, metabolism of a tree, much like, you know, that's like saying, like, do you have to feed a little kid more? Uh, yeah, sure, uh, because a little kid's metabolism is fast, they're young, their body is functioning at a much more rapid pace than, uh, you know, 60-year-old or even a 40-year-old, and, you know, being 30, 35 years old, I'm starting to recognize, like, oh, yeah, sure, don't have that metabolism of a 25-year-old or 15-year-old, you know? It's like the same thing in bonsai. 
But you know, in a bonsai container, a bonsai container functions a lot like dog ears from the perspective that it slows down, a tree ages abnormally fast in a bonsai container. And so with that being the case, that, that rapid aging that takes place in a bonsai container, you can get that reduction to happen, um, but the first few times that you repot are gonna have to happen more rapidly than it would if it were a collected piece of material. For sure, for sure. That's a definitive. How are we doing on time? Hour and a half? People staying with us? Yeah. Hell Tom, yeah. Tom commented that you picked the most difficult transition of nursery stock imaginable. You know, Tom. <laughs> Ryan loves a challenge. You, 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 you know me, uh, and this is, this is Ryan's style as much as anything. Why do it easy? But, you know, the th here's, here's the other thing about this, though, you, you know, that I really wanted Mariah Live to be. If I wanted to show you guys how to create the same tree that every other YouTube video shows you how to create with nursery stock, then what would be the difference between what we do and what they do? You know, because I think people are always looking for that intangible quality. Like, what, what is it that you guys do at Bonsai Mirai that makes it different than everybody else? And it's not the quest to be different. It's just that constant draw towards that challenge and, and viewing that challenge as literally the kind of the driving force in why we do what we do. So, you know, this piece of material is just another example of how can we rethink what is commonly accepted as good and make it good from the level that we're trying and motivated, and you know, for me, I would say downright possessed to create. And, um, and voila, this is what we have. But, you know, the funny thing about it is these techniques, what I'm doing right now, are so within every single one of your skill sets. If you know how to wire one branch, then you know how to wire two branches and three branches and five branches. And basically what I'm doing right now is I'm just wiring one branch after another branch after another branch. Granted, I'm wiring it fast and um, probably quite proficiently, or at least I uh, attempt to do that. It's not a secret what I'm doing, right? Um, and then the next thing is if you can air layer, then you can air layer a small tree or you can air layer a big tree. Well, you can air layer on a straight line or you can air layer on a diagonal line. There's no rules that are stopping you from being able to take that concept of air layering and adapt it to be able to create great trees, right? And so all of a sudden when I look at this and I function through it on my brain, I'm saying, but actually this is quite fundamental in terms of everything that we're doing. Here's a piece of nursery stock. Here is how, after analyzing all of its best qualities, I see the best way to use it. And I recognize like not a lot of other people see it that way. Because all I'm doing now is just creating a bunch of tiny trees. It's awesome. We love tiny trees here. We, love, we like tiny trees. <laughs> hey, tiny trees. Right, you can see all these little trunks forming. It's like a little forest, you see it? Yeah, I mean, I'm seeing it now. Kinda? Yeah. You see it? I see it on the left side. Yeah. Arthur, are you into so, it? So are you envisioning this being like moss and soil kind of going up around the mass or this coming, so it looks like more of a forest or I wonder? No, no, I want this to be I really, I really, really, really want this to be like a, like a natural clump. I see. So the, so the. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tie that there the so that right there. you guys can, you guys have like that reference. This will be good to help you guys understand this. Okay, this is gonna form the base. This is gonna be the base. So the roots will emerge from here. Okay, which is kind of an interesting base too. They call this a turtleback base right here. You see this a lot with trident maples that are air layered in Japan, this kind of formation with multiple trunks and whatnot. It's a very common response to air layering for a trunk to form like that. And the, the, the craziest thing about this is I'm gonna be virtually done with this in the time that we have. 
virtually. It may go over by an hour or so. I'm just kidding. You know, but I think um, I think dispelling the the limitations that we have in bonsai of our expectations of what is or what has to be is really at the epicenter of using nursery material well. Because nursery material doesn't, it's never going to give you perfect. It's never going to, you're not going to walk into a nursery and find like this massive Moyogi style informal upright trunk tree and be like, oh, funny that somebody didn't notice this for a period of 85 years as it barked up and developed perfect branching. Like that's, that's not, that's, we're not living in the real world if that's what we're going there to find. But when you start to talk about applying the fundamentals of how we build and develop material, and there's a very, very big difference between the concept of being a bonsai maker and a bonsai refiner. And there aren't a lot of bonsai makers left in the world. You know, Mr. Kimura was a bonsai maker. We were growing material consistently uh, at his garden for the purpose of him doing avant-garde work. And those, that was really what took me to his place, was his ability to make as opposed to buy. I never could have anticipated this going this way tonight in seeing the tree today. <laughs> no. Uh, me neither. Me neither. Okay, I'm almost done with this rear portion so that I can come back to being friends with Arthur. Huh? Yeah, that'd be nice. Spending an awful lot of time in that macro shot. Almost there. Be patient, guys. Backside of the tree is always the least enjoyable. But actually, the most important, if we're just talking about it, and I'll show you guys, once we get through this design, I'll show you guys kind of all of those nuances. And you know what, what else is interesting about the connected root and the clump style? There's almost like a maturation process to bonsai when you start talking about the styles that generate the most interest in a beginner. And the connected root and the clump style is not necessarily a style that is typically enjoyed by beginners, but it is something that probably a lot of material offers the opportunity to pursue for beginners. Why is it, why is it not something that... Um, I think it's an acquired taste to, to see multiple trunks showing you know, uni unity in design, etc. So notice how we're starting to see so many of those trunks becoming visible, working together. When you guys are looking at this, you've got this trunk. Now this, this line, so now that we're starting to see some of this, this line is not very attractive. I can push in there. I can pull out there. When you say it's not attractive, what about it? It was straight, very straight. Okay. In a very straight section. We're trying to create a real, um, a lot of movement that has harmony and has some continuity of design concept. Mm. So to put that movement in and then back and give that little jog right there, improves the quality of that trunk. But notice you can see this space, you can see this space, you can see this space. We're starting to get this parsed out so that we can see all of these different pieces. And this is what's starting to make this whole composition really work. So the way you just had it, was that the front? This is the front right here. Yeah, from, the, from that camera, this is the front. So where you're at, it's right, right there. Yeah, it reminds me of the beach forest. Yeah, right? Kind of, kind of, but yeah. all off of one trunk. Right. Yeah, cool. Okay, so now when I'm looking at this from where you guys are at, I wanna see this kind of give me the movement that defines this shift. This is very short. We're pushing in here, we're pushing out there. That gives this composition that movement. So I've kept this really short in here and intentionally left that length over there. I'm coming there next and Arthur's gonna be there to capture it. 
Okay, so let's work this piece, Arthur. So we've got two pieces left before we get to the primary final trunk. Um, and it's happening very well. Now, if I just want to take you guys on a little bit further aspect of evolution, then I would start talking to you guys about how we're going to create deadwood on this so that these aren't just 100% living. You know, we walked you guys through the creation of uh, deadwood or the reduction of live vein stream on that little uh, Kishu juniper. Imagine if you created three quarters of these trunks as deadwood and you had this deadwood creeping up through the fol foliar mass as well as all of these little tiny trunks coming off of that same base and you've got this wonderful root base and this very small tree in this very shallow pot because it's air layered. Now you're starting to talk about just this magical quality tree. That's what nursery material gives you the opportunity to do. So I'm thinking down the line and I'm looking at that and I'm saying, gosh, if we, if we make deadwood on three quarters of this composition, we've literally just created a world-class juniper, like a, like a world proper world-class juniper. And if you guys look at the Nolanders Trophy albums um, from Europe, there are several trees in, mo in recent years that are nursery-grown material that was manicured into amazing show, at least prize-winning, maybe not show-winning, but prize-winning trees. That's where I see this headed, a, a, a man-made, Nolanders Trophy-esque winning kind of tree. So you say deadwood is an easy way to make nursery and sort of humble material, especially junipers, look amazing. What are some other ways that nursery stock or beginners, maybe if they're looking at material, they don't know they could do this, but it just instantly or, you know, in a, in a short amount of time increases value. What are some other things? Yeah, so I think, well, number one, I think adding, adding movement, right? And, and adding that movement by structurally changing the primary line of the trunk, okay? So that you add that different angles, different spaces, different planes. More movement is always gonna equal more value. I mean, almost inevitably, okay? I think that um, expanding the root base as much as possible, whether the tree has it or whether you use air layering to do that, that is a great way to enhance the quality of nursery stock, right? So that's another one. Um, when I'm doing this structure and I'm setting this tree up in the first styling, what I want you guys to be paying attention to as I start to get towards a location where you can see it with the design with a lot more clarity, pay attention to the fact that each of these branches has a similar angle of descent from the trunk, okay? Because setting that up so that we've got continuity in the design is what allows me to accomplish and establish asymmetry. And I wanna, I wanna come back to that because Kendall, you're asking some super solid questions. I'm like, in, like heavily involved in the design of this. So I, I know that like there's more for the beginner to be sussed out, keep teasing that out. Mm. This, this piece uh, of this, is gonna be a big one for the people watching. And that is, notice that all of the branches have a lot of continuity of movement. Okay, so hang on, let me, let me pull this. I'm gonna do this trunk, and then I'm gonna pull it forward, and you guys can see this characteristic. <clears throat> Boom. Boom shakalaka. P.S. A lot of wiring to get through in two hours. Yeah. L luckily, I've done it before, yeah. This takes me back to my days traveling. You're cooking. This takes me back to my days traveling throughout the United States. Oh, I've got an hour and a half to do this demo instead of two, and you brought me a tree that should take me legitimately four. Yeah, I can do it, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> Mariah style. Mariah style. Now, I, every time I go watch a demonstrator now, I always feel like, oh, you poor thing. Poor, poor thing. Not like I didn't enjoy it. I actually, you know, Mariah Live continues to kind of 
hone my bonsai instinct because you know people talk about demonstrations as if it's not a true form of bonsai. I absolutely disagree. I mean, when I've got to when I've got to do work and get it done in the workshop, I work this fast. You know, it's not it's not the consistent, it's not the always, but it's it's a fairly significant part of my skill set as a professional and any professional should be being able to do the work proficiently with with pace. And that was a big part of Mr. Kimura and being his apprentice is he pushed speed constantly. We were never able to just sit in the workshop and leisurely work. He was pushing speed constantly because speed speed is money for him. I mean, it was a business. Let's let's be really honest about that. So with this branch that was kind of cut sharply, uh -huh. are you going to come back and make that? That will tie that will tie into deadwood, right? Right. So that that back piece where it's cut will definitely be part of a shari that runs down the trunk. You want to show them? And creates that interest. Yeah, I will show them. Let me. Easy. Easy now. <laughs> Give me one sec. One more branch. <sighs> Faster. Tony just asked a question, and I'm not sure what it means, but I think you will know. Um, what type of hachi do you have in mind for this kabu dachi? <laughs> what great. does that mean? <laughs> hachi is the Japanese word for pot. Okay. And kabu dachi is the Japanese word for clump. Cheeky. Very cheeky. Tony. So that's Tony from the Bay Area. Tony, Tony's from Union City. Ah, a big hello to you, Tony. How you doing, buddy? Okay, uh, so let me show you on detail here. So this uh, stump cut right here, Arthur, can you get that? Okay, so that, now notice that there's no branches along the bottom side of this. This, yep, this would be a perfect, there's no branches along the bottom side. Perfect opportunity to extend deadwood all the way down to the base, okay? So I've got these two pieces that I'm gonna drop back in here, and then I've got this piece that's gonna give me the rear portion, and then we're just to this trunk and this trunk, and this is gonna have heavy reduction. We're literally there, right? So I'm gonna keep on rocking. But let me rotate to the front real quick. Junior, go ahead and blast this out for a second. Now, that, that fundamental piece that I was talking about with Kindle, notice how all of the branches have a similar angle of drop throughout the tree, right? You see that similar angle. Now they may have movement, but that angle of drop, and it's tough to see with that unfinished there. So when I get this done, you'll be able to see it a lot. That is a very fundamental aspect of creating a tree for the first time and establishing that structure that's only gonna get better. And I'll be able to kind of hone and dial this in a little bit more once I get these wired. Pay attention to that though. That's a very important piece of this whole um, process of styling and, and, and getting this to where it needs to go. Because if we can create that uh, unified design concept, we start to really um, build that, that total image in a way that gives us a really beautiful foundation of design. And, and the big piece that you touched on, Kindle, that, that we've kind of reiterated, this is about primary lines, primary branches, primary decisions, stylistically, this, this wiring is. And this is what you're gonna have to do on nursery stock. You're gonna have to define the primary lines of the tree in every way, shape, and form in order for a piece of nursery material to develop the bones for the future. Musical chairs on the cameras, huh, boys? Bringing it back, Arthur's headed back to the keyboard. You didn't uh, tell Tony what the hachi uh, you had in mind. That's right. I, <laughs> I was just excited Tony was watching. <laughs> uh, and I can just see Tony smirking as he said that. Just, uh, yeah. P.S. 
it would be nice to get back to that sushi place in San Jose that we went to uh, that one night before I took off for Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, that was amazing. But anyway, that's a story for another time, Tony. Um, so I think with a, I think with a kabudachi or a clump style tree or a, you know, you could call it a netsura, a connected root style. One of the commonly accepted container types would would be a real shallow oval or rectangle, almost like a almost like an informal upright sort of concept to the container. But I, you know, one of the most one of the most I would say powerful impressionistic trees that I've seen was shown at the Artisan's Cup and it was Ted Madsen, who was an original teacher of mine. And again, talking about these styles becoming um, acquired tastes of maturity as you evolve through the bonsai process. Um, you know, Ted Madsen has this beautiful femina forest that is extremely old and extremely slender because he keeps the foliage mass on it so um, sparse so that it never has a chance to thicken. And it's actually, you know, for Ted, he, I, don't, I don't know whether Ted does it intentionally or if it's just when he can get to the tree, but the way that he keeps it sparse is he does the work on the foliage at a time of year just prior to when the tree starts to thicken and add a lot of vascular tissue. So he's always reducing the foliage mass before the tree puts on its vascular growth in the fall. So he never has the foliage mass to really pump a lot of resources through that tissue. And um, that tree, and Arthur, you took the picture of it on the Skylab stand in black and white. It's on a stone slab, it's on a granite stone slab. It's a ton of real slender trunks sticking up. It's like literally one of my most favorite photographs that you've ever taken. Um, that, that tree on that granite slab with, that, with this directional insinuation, sticks in my mind as one of the most powerful bonsai images that I've ever seen. Ah, someday. Maybe we'll post it on Instagram or something. Okay. <laughs> bonsai. Okay, so with this last trunk, I want to have a real similar foliage density, and this last piece was probably the only trunk or the only branch at that point in time that was sitting on the exterior that had just this really robust quantity of foliage growing on. Everything else has been extremely, extremely sparse. Uh, and so it's interesting to be getting to one that does have uh, a formidable amount of foliage because it gives us opportunities to do things that the other pieces have not but I wanna take this down to the same density as the other ones. Otherwise, one, this will thicken faster, but also two, it carries with it a little bit of a different feel. And I don't want that, I don't want that different feel in this composition. I want this, this composition to stay very, very slender and feminine and sparse and light and really show kind of this character that we're trying to suss out of this tree. <clears throat> Now this is all a part of what I would consider to be pretty advanced bonsai design to be making those decisions of what you take off and why you take them off. Because anybody can cut a branch off, but a lot of times for any of, any of um, anybody out there who's designing bonsai, we all know that we've cut off branches to make our wiring easier. We all know that we've cut off branches because we really didn't want to wire it. But are we cutting off branches because design-wise it enhances the quality of the tree? And one of the things that started to become very commonplace as discussion in bonsai while I was in my apprenticeship in Japan is this whole concept of less is more and like the literati movement, you know, where we started like saying like, oh man, that tree would be great if we just cut off 60% of the foliage mass. Probably true on one out of the 10 times that it was applied because you had all of these big, huge, powerful bases with like one branch and people are like, that's a literati. And that, and that never worked for me. So we want to be balancing that foliage mass as much as we possibly can.
Are we almost at a point where you can show us the longest? We're, get, we're, we're getting close. I'm Kendall. so impatient. You're, I know you're. Want to know? You're, you're kind of, you're kind of putting a lot of pressure on me tonight. Well, this whole, I've heard the words primary, tertiary, okay, well, secondary, I mean, put, okay, thrown around, good. but I still, I, I can't. Guess what? I still don't understand in my Guess head. Guess what? You're gonna be rewarded for having stuck around. Awesome. Right? Okay. <laughs> I'll have to make sure you get taken care of. <laughs> for crying out loud. <laughs> Let me go a little more. Ah, there we go. Okay, so notice the trunk hanging off to the right there. We get that length. Now, is the length going to be, and this is where we can start to play, does the length come here? Or do we push this in and have the length come from this upper piece, right? And this is really where we, it's design starts to be fun because we can do a lot of interesting things. Now, what most people tend to assume is that this needs to be the lowest branch, right? But for this to be the length up here at the tip, that's interesting. Now, this is something that's off the beaten path, starts to give your bonsai design just a little, little something, something, little nuance, okay? I'm gonna pull this piece back so that it's not in competition. Notice the fall of the branches. All of the branches, very similar in their fall. Not similar in terms of they have the exact same shape, similar in terms of their fall or their angle of drop. That's what I was talking about when I was saying, as, a, as one of those fundamental pieces, Kendall, you kept saying, okay, so what, what can beginners latch on to, right? Right. If you create a structure where you have a real similar angle of drop, what happens is you automatically build asymmetry into your design. How does that work? How does that work? Have you thought about it at all, or are you just asking? I mean, I'm, it, it doesn't make... Sense. I'm trying to think about it. Right, okay. So think about this. Standard bonsai concepts of design. Your first branch is here. Your next branch is here. Your next branch is here. Your next branch is here. And your apex is here. What does that create? A circle. What is a circle? A circle is symmetry, okay? Now follow me here. First branch is here. This is where we establish that angle. Next branch is here. Next branch is here, next branch is here, next branch is here. What does that create? Asymmetry. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you establish that first angle, right, which I set on this very first trunk, and I have not deviated from this very first trunk, right? This was set, and that was the, the starting point for the whole design after the structure of the trunks themselves were created. When I set that, boom. I followed that through each successive branch across the design, and now what you're seeing is asymmetry in the canopy of the tree. Asymmetry, for you guys that are creating trees as beginners, that is the way that you get people to look at your tree and invest in the design that you've, you've injected into that piece. I'm... Stoked. Could, couldn't, have, couldn't have purchased a better piece of material. Couldn't, couldn't have, not from that nursery, not for that price, not for what I'm gonna have in 18 months. This was it, this was number one. Very proud of myself. <laughs> and I'm having a lot of bonsai fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're all here. That's why we're here, bonsai, ah! So I wanna go back, Kindle. I want to have a conversation with you. Yeah. Okay. Um, you have asked me kind of time and again, there are things that you're trying to understand that I'm not answering. Right? Right. Give me some of those again. What, what, what hasn't been satisfied for you in terms of as a beginner, what you would want to know to take a piece of nursery stock and make a bonsai out of it? Um, I guess... Has this not helped you at all? First of all, let's go there, because that matters. You can say, no, I'm just as clueless as I ever was. Well, in a way, it's interesting, because I don't, I don't know that I would have ever thought of what you did. Definitely not. Um, so that's interesting, but I still don't know that I would have the confidence to try to do that. Uh-huh. Um, 
But I think a question that remains that you're probably just going to have to keep repeating for me uh-huh. to understand is just the how the lines of the primary, secondary, like how setting the structure, how that, how I can envision that moving forward uh-huh, uh-huh. and how that changes the way I do in the present. Uh-huh. Because I can't really envision where the tree is going next or gotcha. what it could, what it could look like where you, I think you can do that a lot easier. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, <clears throat> I definitely can, but I don't want to, I don't want this stream to, which it has and inevitably always will be about Ryan having fun um, more than anything <laughs> because I love, I love doing this. Right. But I also, for everybody that's watching, that's a beginner, that's like, dude, we thought you were going to show us how to like do something that we can. I, I want to come back to the way that, that I teach at Mirai. And the reason that I teach this way is because nobody ever told me this stuff. Okay? You guys have the ability now. When you go to a nursery, okay, and I'm going to stop for a second. I'll come back to the work. When you go to a nursery, you have the ability to select a piece of material that has some interesting feature, right? Whether that's a needle, whether that's a, a piece of foliage, whether that's a flower, whether that's a movement, whether that's a, a piece of deadwood, whether that's a thick trunk. You have the ability to go in and assess the width of the base. Does it have an expanding base, right? As you dig down into that soil and it flares out into that roots, is it getting wider? Does it have interesting movement? And you have the knowledge now of what good movement is. What is good movement? different angles, different spaces between the angles, and different planes, okay? Mm. You have that knowledge now, right? And you know that the thing that makes that unique is something special, a special feature. Is that a piece of deadwood? Is that interesting bark? Is that a wonderful branch? Is that a hollow? Those three things help you select that material. Those three things also help you select the front. You know to bring it home, and the courting process of getting to know that tree in analyzing those features is cleaning out the dead, opening it up, and you understand now that by establishing that initial angle, right, when you wire that first branch and following that angle with your successive branches, you can create asymmetry into your design. So you can select a good piece of material, you can choose a good front, and you have the fundamental knowledge of structural setting or primary lines to be able to create branching that maximizes your bone side design. I don't know a single resource in the world that in one working, whether it's this complex or it's one single trunk on this tree, could get you that far in terms of beginning bonsai understanding, right? That is, nobody ever gave that to me. Uh, There you go. So I'm going to ask it again. You might get angry. Could you point out to me the lines again, the primary lines? Primary lines are the trunks, Kendall. Are the trunks. Are the trunks. But you say something about like length. And then apex, and then... Sure, sure. Let me get there. Okay. okay. I'm, 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 I am so close. Gre- uh, Rich has a question um, <coughs> for the common beginner okay. um, things. What are the most common mistakes and how to fix them? Common mistakes, cutting off too many branches. How to fix it, don't. I'm just <laughs> kidding. I'm just kidding. No, I think, I think one of the common mistakes uh, is is not setting, and this is, this is for the structure, okay? So, Kindle, now we're gonna come back to it even though I'm not ready to do this, okay? <laughs> primary lines number one, these trunks are all primary lines, okay? Primary line number two, these defining branches that form the a structure off of the trunks, okay? So when we talk about secondary lines, we're talking about, and I'm gonna turn this back and Junior zoom me in here, okay? And I want to focus on this branch right here. Okay, so primary line in the trunk, primary line in the branch, secondary line are these branches coming off of our primary lines. Okay, if we talk about tertiary lines, we're talking about when this tree starts to mature and we get a level of ramification where this, these small pieces here actually become branches. Those then become tertiary, right? So we've got primary trunk, primary branches originating from the trunk, secondary branches originating from primary branches. Could we point out that zoom in in the beginning? I think we missed that part. Okay. So we got primary line of the trunk, primary branches emerging from the trunk, secondary branches emerging from your primary branch, 
and tertiary branches emerging from your secondary branches. Right, so it's like a, it's like a building, right? You got a foundation, you got walls, and then you got sheetrock and paint, right? Your foundation and walls are your trunk and your primary branches. Your sheetrock is your secondary and your paint is your tertiary, right? It's just a, it's a system that's mm. created to build that density and that structure in the tree. And so coming back to that concept of what do beginners usually do that impedes their ability to, and I'm gonna say with the knowledge that you guys have after this stream, you could go to a nursery. I would put most of you in a position to go to a nursery and find yourself a piece of material that could become a worthy bonsai. It's not that, um, it's not like what I've said is immediately lodged in your brain for forever. You would have to work at it. Like, okay, I, I, I need a base that flares. I need, uh, I need a trunk line that has natural movement, and natural movement means different spaces, different planes, and different angles. Okay, okay I got that. I got, got those different spaces, planes, and angles. Okay, and then I need some sort of interesting feature, okay? And when I'm looking at this sea of 500 trees, what makes any of these different? Ooh, look at that one. I see where the branch is broken. That's your end, right? Ooh, look at that one. I see that branch coming up and all the rest of them are laying down. That's your end, right? Ooh, look at that one. I see that one has particularly tight foliage. That's your end, right? So you're going in and then you inspect that base, you inspect that line, you inspect those features and you say, this is the one. This is a $20 juniper. I'm gonna take it home, right? I know that, that ba the widest base, the best line, and that place where I see those features, that's gonna be my front, okay? So this is where I'm gonna start looking at design from. Awesome, got it. Now when I set that very first branch, when I set that very first branch, the lowest piece on the tree, when I set that first primary line, I'm gonna establish that angle, right? Because if I don't set this angle, if I'm too scared and I set the angle here, I set the angle here, then you're gonna have symmetry in your design, right? And that's a beginner mistake. But if you set that angle and the next one follows that angle and the next one follows that angle and this one over here has a similar angle and a similar angle, you create asymmetry naturally, it's organic, right? How are we doing on time? 215. 215. kind of feel like I got to finish it now, don't you? You're almost there. Yeah, legitimately. Not fronting. So, Kendall. Yeah. First nursery stock series stream. Yeah, I think it was awesome. A, B, C, D, or F? A. Really? Yeah, I feel like I learned a lot. Because I've never been explained that, that stuff. Tight. Yes. From such a, you know, rudimentary standpoint. It's interesting, right? It is. Here's, here's, the, here's the other funny thing about this, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say this at the risk of defaming professionals across the world. There aren't many people that have ever quantified what is good movement in bonsai. There aren't many people that have ever quantified how do you select a front? What are the features that go into selection of front? And what we're gonna be working on moving forward, which I think is a big part of not being able to fully grasp how you design your own bonsai, is not understanding design yet. And that's where that design primer that we talk about is gonna be of utmost importance. Because once that design primer comes out and people are like, oh, that's why you did that. That's why the length is here instead of here. That's why the apex moves that way instead of that way. That moment for people across the world is gonna be like, bonsai design all of a sudden makes sense. If it were me, I think I would have the urge to, if, if I did this styling, I would wanna come back later and like tinker with it further. Sure. How, what's the guidelines for this styling process and yeah, sure. timing and how many times can you mess with it? <laughs> I mean, so let's just be really honest, right? If you guys are buying nursery stock to learn how to do bonsai, by all means, tinker. Tinker, touch, play with, kill it, break it. 
Like that's why you're buying a 20 or $30 tree from a nursery and you're gonna love it. You're gonna love it because that's what bonsai does to you. You become attached to it. If you don't love it, you should stop doing bonsai, right? But you have to give yourself the freedom to understand what it feels like to work bonsai, to handle a bonsai, to kill a bonsai in order for you to become good at bonsai, right? And so what are the rules? The less you touch it, the greater the chance it survives. <laughs> right? That's the rule. Neat. Right? But how do you get good at bonsai? You get good at bonsai by killing bonsai. That's how you get good at bonsai. You know, and this is not something that I promote. I'm not saying everybody go out and kill their bonsai. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> what I am saying, though, is if you guys are too scared to try and you're too scared to experiment with this kind of material, right? I mean, this is, this for me is a, this is a, like I said, I paid way too much money for this tree because we were on a time crunch for, for this stream, okay? And there were other extraneous factors that were impacting the speed that we had to select the material. But this is a $70 piece of material for me. This is the cheapest piece of material I've purchased in five years. And you love it. And I love it. I, lo I love this tree. I love this tree. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up that conversation about fear. I feel like that's a big thing that's inhibiting me from starting just because I don't want to mess up. I don't want to kill something. Sure. Uh, and I don't want to make something that doesn't look good. Ah. But how do you make something that looks good if you don't make something that looks good? I know. It's a silly thing. but It is, but it's an American thing. This is an, I went to Japan. I went to Japan not having ever fully wired a single tree. I went and studied with Masahiko Kimura, the most famous bonsai master in the world, and I had never wired a full bonsai tree. Never, not once. Put that in your pipe. Are you serious? Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Wait, I thought you were doing it all those years. I was, I was. Not well, I was too scared. Literally, I went to Japan and I didn't know how to wire. I didn't know how to wire. People thought, like, I knew, I knew interesting design. I had good ideas. I had creative trees. I had high quality material. Same situation I see across the United States on a continual basis. You see people that aren't afraid to invest in the material. You see people that are super passionate and you see people that are absolutely debilitated by fear. So right? how did you get over that? I got freaking yelled at on a continual basis for seven years. So that's six. <laughs> but how can we get over that? <laughs> Come to, come, come to Mariah and I'll yell at you. No, I'm come just kidding. Here. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I think that you um, shed the expectation that the first time you do bonsai, it's going to be good. I think you shed the expectation that the second time you do bonsai, it's going to be good. I think you shed the expectation that the 20th time you do bonsai, it's going to be good. But you understand that each time you're getting better, right? right? So what I ended up having to do because I was, you know, really inexperienced. And, and for me, it worked out. It worked out because I honestly didn't have a ton of bad habits and, and ego built up around my bonsai abilities. Like I knew when I went to Japan that I didn't know anything. Mr. Kimura told me, he said, I would rather have an apprentice know nothing than an apprentice think that they know everything, right? Because then it's just a pain in the butt to try and teach you how much you don't know. For me, it was like, nah, I, I, we're good, we're good, I'm, I'm good. I don't know anything. And he was like, cool. But most people think that I went to Japan probably having this massive skill set built up. Nah, no, nope. no. Nope. I knew how to collect trees out of the mountains about as good as anybody did at that time. That was, that was all the experience I had. I had a ton of great material. I had a ton of enthusiasm. I had a lot of notions of what I wanted to learn from Mr. Kimura to work with the material I was collecting in the United States. I didn't have a single skill built up. Yeah, so did having great material, did that kind of allow you to like hide behind a lack of skill because the material spoke for itself? I or? think that the material gave people the impression that I was much better at bonsai than I was. I see. Um, and I was serious about it, you know? Like I, I, I made sure that that material was healthy. I made sure that material looked good, but I also knew that I did not have the skills to be touching that material. And so I saved it all and I went to Japan and learned how to properly handle that material with respect. And uh, you know, it's, it's in Japan, one of the things that I did to get over this fear myself was beyond my study at Mr. Kimura's was I went home every night and if he did a technique that I didn't understand or I wanted to learn more about, 
then I would, um, I would go on Yahoo Auction Japan, I would buy a really crappy tree, and I would bring it home, and I would do that work on it, that technique. And what you start to realize is a big part of technique and a big part of what I'm doing here is knowing how to use your hands, right? Dexterity in bonsai is, is practiced. It's not natural. It, it's learned. It's not, it's not born into you. And so you start doing these really difficult techniques. You guys watch my hands move in this, and it makes everything look really easy. Well, Mr. Kimura would force me to watch him how to wire, and he would say, can you do this? And I'd be like, yeah, 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 yeah. That looks, looks pretty easy. Nah. You know, then you'd try it, and you'd be like, oh, I, I have no freaking clue what I'm doing. So I would go home, I would try these, and I had a refrigerator box full of dead trees in my apartment from all of the failed experiments. Then I could go back and I could be like, ah, oh, I didn't know how to do this. Next time he does it, I know what I don't know. How did he use his hands? Where did that, where did that piece of wire go? How did he prevent the tree from taking the impact? How did he focus the, the force of the bend? All of those things became what I keyed into. But you had to make that, I had to go home and make those mistakes to know what I needed to be focusing on. That has, has been the epicenter of what's built Mirai, was learning how to learn via that process of failure, trial, trial and error. It's been, a very, it's very, been a very humbling process to learn bonsai. And the, you know, the product of Mirai Live is to share that humility and also kind of that information being conveyed in a way that nobody else is teaching it so that Mariah Live members can hopefully get to those points faster than I did. It's going to be pretty tough, though. You're going to have to wire a couple trees. Well, this one has inspired me to, uh, to go to the nursery to get something. Has it? More so than other streams. Because other streams, I'm like, oh, I can never do that. <laughs> Kendall, you just totally made my night. That's awesome. A lot of people are thanking us in the chat. Nice, nice guys. Hang on, we're almost there. I got one back branch and then we're gonna be dialed. I'll pull this forward. We'll talk about some serious concepts of design for the last time. You guys can go have a wonderful uh, sleep if you're on the East Coast. If you're not already asleep and banking on the archive, you're in the Midwest or you're in the central portion of the country. Thanks for sticking with us. If you're in the West Coast, we're just starting to get into those evening twilight hours. Um, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope that this series uh, sheds some light on how you guys access material that allows you to explore without fear and really invest in bonsai um, from the perspective of practice and not appreciation. You know, like uh, that, was the, that was the feedback we got from you guys. Help us, help us develop the ability to practice bonsai um, at a higher level. Help us find the material we can um, practice and improve on Okay. All right, guys. Let me just take a look. Oh, geez. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. I'm sorry. It does look That's awesome. awesome yeah. Right? Okay. So you guys see where the base is going to be. You see that towel. You've got all of these trunks. All of those trunks are going to be in the soil line. You've got that really tall upper piece. Now notice what's happening here in terms of this discussion of asymmetry. Pushed in here, peak of it here, running out with length here, longest point on this side. Maybe that's the best move. Maybe that's the best move to give that kind of length and elongation, that flow in that direction. Okay, so even though we've got multiple trunks, this is one composition. One composition has flow as a cumulative effect of all trunks, okay? So we've learned base, line, features, selection of front, clean out, establishment of ankle, uh, angle, all right? You guys in one live stream know more than any other beginner bonsai practitioner in the world, all right? I hope this was effective. Do we have any more questions before we cut out? Uh, Brandon wants to know about wiring Prostrata Juniper nursery material right now. Are we good? Right now's the time, Brandon. That's it. That's it. 
Thank you guys so very much. Uh, this is super exciting and fun for me to dig back into the memory bank a little bit and, and go back to kind of that epicenter of my beginning in bonsai. Um, I know that this probably didn't look the way you thought it did, but I hope it looked even better, or I hope you're able to hear what I'm saying and, and see the difference in how it was applied compared to the standard that's been set for how we teach bonsai. I don't believe in that. It's why we're doing this. Um, you guys have a lot of solid concepts to latch on to. This will be available in the archive for free. For free. For free. You guys can continue to reference this. Tell your friends. Go back and find the value in it. Good luck in your bonsai practice. Thank you for the support. We will see you guys on Thursday for Tier 3 members, next Tuesday for everybody else. Have a great week, you guys.